uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all for this uh, <coughs> for this event, the role of emerging technologies in business. Uh, in fact, the dean uh, should be with us now for uh, introductory comments. However, he got uh, COVID-19 uh, just recently, and therefore he couldn't yani, attend this uh, this meeting. Sure. Uh, he asked me to convey his uh, yani, his uh, greeting to all the speakers, the attendees, and uh, yani, we are sure that this will be very helpful, very insightful, based on the knowledge, the experience of all the speakers, and. <clears throat> Uh, and the discussion that, that will uh, follow. Uh, so uh, I will leave the floor for Mr. Mustafa to start the, uh, the forum. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Thars. Uh, thank you for um, completing that part. Thank you for those opening remarks. I'd like to welcome everyone. I think we're just a few. I think, yeah, we'll start now. Uh, we have, it's a, uh, it's lovely to see everyone. I'd like to welcome all of our panel members. So we're having panel members from at least four different continents, which is fantastic. So we have uh, speakers from North America, South America, and we have panel members locally and from Europe. So it should be a uh, very enlightening, very insightful um, afternoon. I'm going to basically leave the floor for our keynote speaker to arrive. So our keynote speaker is, is um, Mr. Martin Lewitt. He is the senior vice president for NISM.com. And NISM.com, it's uh, what I consider to be one of the leading digital solutions companies in the world. They power some of the most complex and busiest e-commerce sites in the, in the United States. So Macy's.com, Gap.com are some of the sites that they are, Nissan.com is, is powering. So they're the, the workforce behind it. So we'll just give it a few more minutes and then we'll just have Martin uh, join us because his time is still five minutes away, so he'll join shortly. So as you know, digital and emerging technologies is a, is a fascinating area. It's one of those areas that at KBS, we, are, we have embarked on providing courses in this very emerging and a very popular technology set. Blockchain, data analytics, and artificial intelligence, these are all areas that we are very, very excited about at KBS. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful time, really it is, because we are working with an amazing set of opportunities in terms of building next generation technologies. So I, like I tell my students and my colleagues and clients a lot, we're at the time of the Jetsons era where you're able to have flying cars, flying you know, automobiles, autonomous vehicles. So super interesting time for sure. And um, so we're really, really blessed that we are, have embarked on this decade of innovation and uh, the likes of which I think they're just really, really wonderful times ahead. So Martin's here, I'd like to, like to welcome Martin. We are, a little bit early, but that's something is, is good to get an early start. So Martin, I've given it just a, a brief introduction on NISM as one of those, as a premier company that does pretty amazing digital solutions around the world and um, naming a few such as Macy's.com, Gap.com. These are a couple of companies that I myself have been talking about in my classes for about a decade plus. So when I learned that uh, your organization is the is the solution provider for these companies, that was it's such a it was just very very exciting for me to be able to introduce that in my classes, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining. I know you're coming in from it's pretty early morning there, 
uh, pretty cold there in uh, in North America. So uh, we have, you know, your one of our uh, panel members, and we welcome you for providing us the keynote presentation. So, um, and Martin Lewitt, as I mentioned, the senior vice president of Adnistan, um, and joining us from New Jersey, I believe, in the U.S. New Jersey, it is. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Martin. Welcome uh, to our first webinar. And I believe you have the hosting ability, so I'll let you drive your presentation. If you don't mind, if you have it handy and you can present it, it will be easier. If not, I can share it with no problems. Okay. I'll give you a minute if you want to bring it up. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. I do have it, Martin, so I can start it up if there are any issues. Well, um, yeah, if you, if you can start it out, that would be fantastic. If you have an issue with it, uh, I, will, I will switch it and start sharing. No issues. Give me a second. I'll, I'll start it up. Thank you very much. And good uh, afternoon, everybody. And uh, well, Mustafa brings it up. Uh, a pleasure uh, to be back um, talking about it. I um, It's always fun. Uh, when we do these presentations, I think uh, this is the third time that uh, Mustafa and I have a partner uh, to put some thoughts together into this very exciting world. And I gotta admit, I haven't talked to him about it yet. Uh, I gotta admit that this is probably um, the most uh, challenging one for me that we've done. Because uh, I remember that uh, one day he comments like, you know, we'd love to talk about the emerging technology and you know how what that means for the future. There's, as he was saying right now, where the jets and zero, so much is going on, and we left it at that that, that very uh, broad title, right? And one of the things he realized once we started thinking about the technology that would shift our future beyond you know what we all know and uh, at a superficial level is like we don't really know much, <laughs> so. Uh, I appreciate Mustafa for the challenge. I spent a whole weekend down several rabbit holes trying to uh, come up with something. And uh, I hope that uh, we can have a fun discussion today. Happy, happy to make this more of a conversation. I have some thoughts about it, but clearly this is an area that uh, is, is ripe for, for discussion and interaction. So. Please feel free to either write uh, on the chat, unmute yourself and talk. I think we have an audience sizable enough that we can have a discussion. And if not, I'll try to bring the conversation to areas uh, to make it interesting. So Mustafa, if you might go to slide number three, the interest slide, that'd be fantastic. Um, how many of you uh, have seen this? Uh, this is Gardner's uh, hypo, hype cycle. Uh, this is for 2021. I think it's close enough. And the first thing that I did when, when you know, when, when Mustafa and I started talking about technologies that will shift our future was like thinking, okay, to be fully honest, you know, some of the tech that will change the future has not even been discovered yet, or is under development in areas that we don't know. Uh, some of it is really developing. And, we know that the piece of change continues to accelerate, but in the large perspective of time, so if you look at this over a large period of, or, or a similar small period of decades or large period of centuries, um, we can get a glimpse of how things advance, right? So in the case of what, um, what Garner puts together here is very interesting. The, the, the line of expectations is not a straight line, right? This is how th hypes these technologies come. And, um, you know, if I actually knew which of these hyper hyped technologies in 2021 will make it all the way to mainstream or plot of productivity in the next five to 10 years, no offense, I will probably not be sitting here. I will be, you know, taking pictures uh, as a Steve Jobs used to did used to do, but that but understanding that means that trying to understand what is happening today and what is to come is gonna help us shape the future. It allows us to be intentional about what we do, uh, which I think is very, very important. So when I started doing this, uh, you know, thinking about how these technologies affect us, 
I remember uh, a trip I did, I was think it's probably 2017 or 2018. So this is like a good, a good three, four years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, we were, as um, Mustafa was uh, discussing before, at Nisum we were kind of ramping up our insight and analytics practice. Um, we were getting deeper into the AI projects, ML projects, data governance projects. Uh, so there was a trip organized to Silicon Valley center around further understanding what's going on in the world with AI. Um, I, was, um, I was living in Chile at that point, leading Latin American operations for NISUM. This was organized by a group of Chileans. And we went to San Francisco and uh, Seattle. And among many great things we discover, uh, um, you know, we visited your your usual players, Amazon's, Google's, Facebook's of the world, what made us of the world. We went to visit some universities and research study centers and things like that. But one of the things that got very, very stuck in my mind that I wanted to bring up today is the big difference you find between this holistic kind of transformation approach of technology when we do these types of discussions where we see end products and how it actually very specific, very, I don't wanna say small, but very specific and very targeted the development of those technologies were. So when we were discussing how AI may shift the world in the next 10, 15 years, a lot of the projects we saw, not all of them, but most of them were, you know, kind of image recognition to solve for one, two or three use cases, right? So when someone falls in a house and there was this whole program by healthcare company that had different cameras in the house that were able to recognize different movements of people. And then if there was an emergency, they were able to generate an alarm or do something, right? It is a very specific use case. It was a whole development team and all it was able to do is detect when a person um, falls, which is very different from this very autonomous house that can do everything. But these technologies are built use case by use case by use case. And then when you put them all together, you get to that to that point. So when thinking about like, okay, what technologies we're gonna do, it's very hard to do. Quantum computer is hugely disrupted, not hyper enough right now. It's right at the bottom, right there, quantum right next to machine learning. Um, we don't hear much about, much about it, but when it comes, it's gonna be huge. Um, AI augmented software engineer, all the hype on development world. So if you are anywhere around development companies, you're gonna be hearing about. Um, AI augmented software engineering, uh, very interesting, perhaps a bit of specific and niche. There's a lot of things going on around the DeFi, the, fina the, the centralized finance, the centralized identities, everything that has to do with um, how things are gonna be centralized through blockchain. That started getting me <laughs> more interested into something those two were in particular, um, a, a little bit too specific. And we already talked about DeFi not long ago. so. Um, I found this, uh, we, we couldn't get, I found this trio of technologies that kind of interact with each other uh, that I think are gonna be hugely disrupted. I'm very uh, fascinated by in the, how blockchain as a technology, you know, where it's going, what it allows, what it means has led to this, the super hype. If you look at the top of the hype, you have the N NFTs, NFTs or non-fungible tokens to create a new web, the web 3.0 or web three, uh, as it is called, and to that vision of the metaverse. It might have been influenced because the metaverse sounds a lot like the multiverse, and I just saw the new Spider-Man movie, which was really cool. Maybe, who knows, they're not the same. They sound familiar, so it makes it more interesting. And so I'm gonna to try to talk today about this trio of, um, these four continuum, I will say, of technologies that blockchain as an abilitator, the new web or how the internet is shifting and, and why that is important to uh, the NFTs. Probably not of the NFT itself, it's just one of the most hype right now, not the most used, just the most hype. Um, and the vision of the metaverse uh, that everybody is is talking about. So hopefully that, that'll be interesting, keep us engaged. Again, if you have thoughts or questions, just put it on the chat. 
Um, and with that little intro, um, let's get into uh, the blockchain, the Web3, and the NIFTIs first, and we go to the metaverse uh, second, right? So blockchain, I think, of all the hype technologies, probably the one um, that we'll talk about today, the one that's been out there the most, hasn't been centuries, but in this day and age, uh, it sounds like a while. And you've heard some of these phrases before um, around you know, how blockchain is shifting the future of business, right? Um, and what, basically what it's doing is allowing to decentralize a lot. and and and. Let's just say that with a grain of salt, right? Ever since we created the internet, we've been talking about decentralization, decentralization of the information, decentralization of the access, of decision-making and of everything. And every new technology promises more autonomous, uh, more engagement and so on. So will this utopian uh, decentralized blockchain world come to be? It's hard to see right now. Um, but you can start seeing uh, how it is starting to engage, to get more and more mainstream, and more of those little use cases start to become bigger and have actual disruptions in many of the maturities. Now, as much as we've heard about blockchain, and it seems like forever, we have to remember that it's still a developing technology. This is not by no means a full mature, at full maturity. It's not something that you know, we get there and, and, and it's already done. And for and as many of those, that means that its future is also uncertain, right? Will all of its potential and abilities come to be? Probably, but we still have a lot of maturity to go through um, to go there. Uh, what we do know is that it is disrupting uh, many industries, right? So when you look at things that are happening right now, especially in the financial services area, for example. Um, one of the first ones to start being disrupted by, uh, by blockchain, you can start seeing how uh, that decentralization is starting to take place. Um, but, but the more interesting part, the question is, okay, what does it mean that this uh, is still developing? If we can uh, move on to the next slide, uh, Mustafa, thank you. I think that it's interesting to put things into perspective. Right, how has, what does it mean and how, how, how long have we had this uh, blockchain, right? So an easy way to look at it is where are we uh, from a timeline perspective uh, in the blockchain future? Uh, now, not all technologies follow the same curve, but as we've seen from uh, the intro, the kind of the ones that make it kind of follow a similar curve of adoption, right? So the current user adoption of cryptocurrency, which is probably the earliest manifestation of the potential blockchain has, by no means the only one, probably, but but yes, the first one that you know allows us to try to understand how adoption is working is similar to what we saw in the internet in 1994. Now, I think one interesting parallel in this is. If you go back, and, and I did, and watch some of the videos of what people were saying on the internet in 1994, those of you who are old enough to, to remember that, um, it's interesting to see how reactions to every technology are very similar. You have the early adopters who fully believe in this and that you know put their lives into, this is gonna change the war, it's gonna be like nothing ever, we ever seen before. And you can say that about most technologies, someone will come out and say, this is it, this is gonna change the world. There's nothing behind, nothing like it. I have the tractors saying, oh, this is a fade. It's gonna come and pass. I don't see the use. Why are we doing this? Why are we using the internet if we have phones? Why are we using email if we have letters? And so on and so forth. Um, now, that doesn't mean that every technology actually changed the world. But the ones that actually, you know, do shape our future for a zero curve of trying to understand uh, where we are. And with blockchain right now, we are at that early uh, stage uh, of the internet um, where it was, right? But 24 years, 24, 25 years later, uh, the internet, half the population of the planet 
was already connected. And that span of only 24 years, right? From this might be very interesting to north of three and a half billion people using it and living connected. Can we expect uh, a similar trajectory for cryptocurrency? Maybe. If it does, it will probably happen faster. So you won't need the full uh, 24 years because we're more connected. So we're starting at a phase, right? So the, 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 I will say the cryptocurrency, while disruptive, is built on the uh, connections that the internet make, right? So it's a lot, it should go a lot faster. And you have seen some of the examples before how this starts to accelerate um, to reach 25% of global market penetration, right? From electricity a long time ago to the web, um, just a few decades ago, the cycles continue to accelerate, mostly because these technologies are built on the networks of the prior technologies, uh, which allows it to move a little bit faster. And another way to see it, if we go to the next one, um, is, okay, what does it mean this from a timeline? Right, so if we grab the graph that we just saw before, and these are some of the um, blockchain-based companies that you can see uh, from, um, sorry, um, some of the blockchain companies that have been uh, created over the last few years. Um, we're still in the building blocks. You can see where we are on the graph, right? Uh, but it should go faster. And the interesting part is that if we follow a similar path, and again, nothing, um, nothing is going to make, uh, there's no predictions here, right? There's, there's no assurances uh, that this is the path that it will follow. But if we follow a similar path, that means that somewhere in the next three to five years, we shall be crossing back into this kind of um, accelerated growth rate of adoption and getting into uh, the mainstream area. Uh, there's a lot of interesting improvements. You can see on the side, on the side, the distributed apps, user experience, uh, interoperability are, are huge. The whole concern around privacy, obviously the pandemic has accelerated a lot of these things. All of these analysis are usually done prior to, uh, to the pandemic, right? And the pandemic sent us all home and accelerated a lot of these trends. Uh, but this just to say that um, we are um, we are at that point. We are at that very interesting point of starting to get uh, to mainstream if, right? Because the one that I'm not showing here is this is the path that technologies that make it follow. Other ones are going to get there and then just go down and be replaced either by a better technology or a different solution, okay? So again, a bit of an intro, but I think uh, it's, it's an interesting way to start um, going into uh, what we're gonna see. So we go to the next one um, and I'll get to um, AI a little bit later, if, if that's okay. I saw the question, uh, okay. but I will address it. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, what is the next step uh, for blockchain? So where are we going with, with all of this, right? So if you think of, um, I'm, I'm gonna go to, to the next slide. Thank you, uh, Mustafa. So if you think about how has the, the web evolved, right? Because I'm gonna move now from, from this blockchain. Uh, I'm not gonna go deeper into cryptocurrency or kind of a general discussion of, uh, of the technology. We can do that another time. I wanted to think about it in the context of the internet. And this is why this whole introduction, right? How is this shifting the way we interact and live digitally? Uh, so if you think about the web, right? You can think about the web 1.0, uh, sometimes called the read-only web back to the 90s, right? And it's usually the earliest, um, sorry, before 90s, sometimes into the 80s, right? The earliest interconnection of networks and the Darbanet in the 70s, sorry. Uh, but but in general, we think about you know the, the large internet in, in, of the 90s. Um, 
Uh, you know, you have the browsers, you have all the websites that flourished in the 90s and we spent a lot of time trying to navigate them. But this was the information economy, right? This was the decentralization, quote unquote, of, of information where every information was at uh, our finger points, right? And we were able to navigate um, well, Yahoo, like us, we didn't make the cuts uh, for those of you who have a few more years, uh, eventually made in all the way to Google, which is still here. Um, you can see in there, you know, messaging apps, um, pre WhatsApp days. Uh, you can, you, you know, you started to get all this uh, consumption of information. This is the information economy. We, we were, you, you know, we, content was published and we consume it. Uh, websites were used for communicating information and the initial kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication started to happen, right? Usually between the early 90s all the way to the early 2000s, those 10 years are kind of the web 1.0. And some of those companies are still here. A lot of those concepts are still key, but it evolved. It evolved into this web, uh, 2.0, um, I, I like the, the one that I found that is called the platform economy because most of the web is now a series of platforms where we, where we interact. So it was built on top of what was already there, right? And, but it was a lot more on generating the um, more participation, I will say, right? So a platform was created where you can interact and create your own content and share. And then all the social media companies, the wikis, the new search ways, uh, most of it now generate by user-generated content, uh, user generated content, right? Uh, on the way we, we, we get to use and interact. Now, a key of this part of the web 2.0, it's a still decentralization, right? Which means, you can create your content and share it and so on, but you do it through a platform or a portal. And that portal is the gatekeeper, uh, which gets us to what Waypoint 3 of, of 3.0 uh, will be the natural, why it goes from 2.0 to 3, anybody's guess. Uh, but the idea is to create platforms that are completely decentralized. So they're independent of companies from the 2.0 business models, uh, which you know generate revenue based on advertisement or subscriptions, and you get users now to pay for say for their service directly with using tokens. Uh, and in an ideal utopian world, which reality you know eventually finds a way to uh, distinguish a little bit from the initial visions of what it was supposed to be. Uh, it will be operated on uh, and improved by the communities of users. Um, and the leap forward has three big characteristics. It, it needs to be open because they're built on open source uh, platforms and they're developed by the community. They need to be trustless because the network allows participants to interact without a uh, decentralized uh, third party. And they need to be permissionless because anyone can participate without the central authority, right? And Bitcoin, probably the first cryptocurrency is the biggest one uh, of, of these uh, new ways of thinking about the web, uh, even though it's not a web, but you can start th seeing uh, where it is going and, and the power that it might have. So uh, as a summary, if we go to the next slide, right, uh, as we try to reinvent the internet. When we move from the uh, 2.0 to a 3.0, I'm gonna get a little bit uh, more technical, but not too much, right? Um, we're currently uh, based on servers. We're moving to peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, we are moving to uh, distributed uh, CDNS and the service layer become, this is very interesting, right? from the API, which is what interconnects uh, the service layer today to the smart contracts, which is to be honest, one of the most, uh, one, one very fascinating area of the web three, smart contracts are contracts that execute themselves 
uh, based on some set of rules that are set from the beginning. And obviously from the centralized database to distributed storage or the blockchain uh, that we uh, introduced before. Um, so in, in general, just like the cryptocurrency instead tries to be the decentralized money, the decentralized apps uh, or dApps uh, is what allows the its counterpart on the website, right? So you have, and, and this is why they are intrinsically, they need to be together. You, you're going to need the tokens to manage this uh, new Web3 or to, to fuel this Web3, and you need the Web3 for uh, the tokens to exceed and, and, and make sense. All right, so hopefully that made sense. Um, and, and we can start to see the power. To be honest, um, one of the most challenging things at this point in time uh, with the Web 3.3, uh, with the Web 3 or with blockchain, I think is the visualization or understanding how this might look like in the future. That is truly challenging. Like how does, well, you know, I'm gonna admit that a lot of these things sound to, like chaos. Right? It sounds like, well, how is it gonna work? And that's because we are very entrenched in what we know. And seeing how uh, this might look after is very challenging. So if you thought that was challenging, if we go to the next slide, I personally found the next one fascinating, but extremely hard to understand at this point. Um, and, and it's one of these beautiful things of you, you don't understand it and then you get a little bit into it and you kind of feel like you understand everything and everything makes sense, which means you're at the exact point that you know nothing, uh, but it's the most dangerous point because it's what you think you know. Uh, and then you read a little bit more and it doesn't make sense. And so it means that we need to keep uh, trying to understand. That's my perspective. I, there's a lot of people out there that are very much into this NFTs uh, part, um, but um, a fascinating one nonetheless, probably the most hype right now. So I thought I'd bring it up and try to challenge everybody to think about, okay, beyond the hype and beyond the uh, speculative finance that is going on around, now around cryptocurrency and NFTs, how can this shape, what it, might its impact be if this actually becomes mainstream, right? So if tokenization is the power to the web 43, NFTs uh, are very similar uh, and they're already in wide use. And if we go to, uh, it's just an, uh, an intro, but just so we can get our things to start thinking about our NFTs, right? So if we, if we make a little bit of memory of where we're coming from, Right, we have this technology in the blockchain that for a lot of time, most of the critics were like, why do we need this, right? We can do the same with databases. Uh, we're starting to see how cryptocurrencies first use became very wide, uh, widely used, and now huge in the market. We see the potentials. We start seeing actual use cases being implemented. And with that, we bring, okay, maybe, it can reshape the way we interact digitally. And that brings us the Web3, right? And so that brings a whole lot of new opportunities. And not long ago, we say, okay, if we go to the next slide, uh, if cryptocurrencies are the fungible digital currency, let's call it similar to our fiat money or regular money, right? You can have a cryptocurrency, all the changes between uh, uh, normal currencies and cryptocurrencies, I think, have been discussed and we did a, a little part. But when you go to real economy, you don't do everything in money, right? You have your fungible money, call it US dollars, call it whatever uh, money you want to run the world, and you have your non fungible assets. For example, the house that I'm sitting on, it's an asset, it can be bought with money, it cannot be transacted for another house. Right, you have to, to do it. So we have on the one side, the fungible part of the assets, US dollars or Bitcoins. Uh, 
you have the non-fungible size of the asset, right? It has something that has a unique property that make it have a different value from other very similar objects, right? So two pieces of art or two houses might be very similar, they have very different prices. Um, and that happens with your NFTs as well. You can have digital non-fungible assets, in this case, tokens, and that even though they're very similar, they can have different uh, values, okay? So this is the, the general concept of what an NFT is, is a digital property that has unique characteristics, making it, um, uh, trans making it uh, non-fungible with, uh, with other tokens, unlike the cryptocurrencies, which are functional. And then within the NFTs, you have the ones that we heard about the most so far, which is the non-actionable NFTs. There are actions that have value, uh, but cannot interact with them except for displaying them. Such uh, a non-actionable asset will be a piece of art, uh, a sports memorabilia, uh, music, videos, any other form of content will be a non-actual NFT. And an actual NFT, which is our items that are gamified or interactive component of them, right? So these assets, you can interact with them. And right now they're mostly focused on gaming, but obviously there's a whole world of things that you can do with them out there that are more uh, interesting. Um, you can breed, you can grow them uh, uh, in games right now. That's usually what most of the actual NFTs uh, can be uh, um, useful right now, but you can start thinking and saying, okay, what if I can interact with uh, these, these assets and what might I be doing with them? And, and that's where kind of a smart contracts get involved and it creates a whole new area of development. And as I said before, uh, if we go to the next one, uh, Mustafa, you know, this is all the hype everywhere. Um, <laughs> the levels of growth and engagement that you're getting uh, as with anything else. If you remember our first hype cycle, right? It goes like in a straight up line uh, when, when things get hype and it's been just crazy. Uh, marketplaces are developing, people are paying uh, huge amount of money to have digital art that we don't even know how it's gonna be used yet. It's very, very, very crazy, right? Uh, you have, Overhyped things like people are selling self uh, self as NFTs, and you go like why, and then you have more interesting, more durable applications like music bands using them to merge the real uh, or not real the uh, non digital and the digital world. Um, when you can buy both the album and some NFT of music around it. Uh, it, it's pretty crazy out there right now. But again, what I invite you to do is to look beyond uh, the hype and try to see, okay, what does it mean? Where is the disruption coming? What is this good for? And what is its point? Um, I have several conversations. I gotta meet a couple of them with, uh, with my wife trying to explain. And she's like, well, why are people paying? all this money for these NFTs, what are they using them for? It's like, well, why do you buy a CD for, to listen to it, right? Well, you can do the same, but you can have the original in an NFT. So this only makes sense if this digital war continues to develop around it, right? So this is how these things make sense in the future. And we are top of the hype cycle. So the question becomes, and we can go to the next slide. Why, what do we do with this, right? And I see four big areas where um, the NFT space uh, is pushing innovation in unique ways, right? And there's four big areas where this is already happening. The one that we hear the most about uh, is probably iron collectibles, right? Anywhere from a sports memorabilia to art to um, I guess selfies uh, uh, for things that people want to use as profile pictures or want to display on a screen. Uh, there's a lot of it going uh, 
going on in this space. Now, again, a lot of it is still uh, speculative, right? People trying to make uh, easy money on a very hype type of assets. But this is where it all started, right? Uh, and growing. One that has probably the most innovation going on right now, and uh, that is getting a lot of resources and a lot of innovation uh, is the gaming space, right? So um, you can, it, it, we have already so many great gaming platforms and now you can have in-game owned assets, uh, purchase to play or play to earn models, implement and explore on different projects when you transact not just fungible, not just money now, but you can own a car within the game. And maybe uh, that car appreciates, depreciates as the game goes on, it can be traded. So you start creating these digital worlds where not only you experiment with money, but as you do in the non-digital world, you do it with non fungible assets as well, be it cars, be it clothing, be it whatever it is. Uh, one that is, <laughs> you know, mind blowing, uh, it will be the beyond the digital space, right? So how does this look if you can actually tokenize or digitalize your um, real assets, your houses, your cars, that you can trade them, transact them, build them together, collaborate to build and things like that. Uh, not as much in that space, uh, right now, but you can see how the merge, uh, and this is usually where the most interesting ha things happen, the merge of the real world and the digital world uh, start making it uh, very interesting. And obviously when these things start to happen, this is when we go more into the mainstream and more and more people get uh, involved. Um, I'm gonna, uh, sorry, the last part, uh, not the multiverse, but the metaverse uh, becomes the, uh, probably where this uh, non fungible become the most interesting and the most, um, and they have the most potential to grow. As we go into immersive digital spaces, then the digital identities or even that art, uh, digital land within that space, retail space within the, that space, 3D avatars that represent their owners, the clothes that we put on them, anything that you're doing in the real world, you need to replicate in the digital world. So all of that creates a huge amount of uh, a space for growth. And now you can start to see why I try to bring all these technologies together today. From the blockchain that is allowing all of these things to really happen because you can actually decentralize with security and create its own digital money to um, the web point three as an expression of how the web we might reinvent digital spaces and interactions and the merge of the digital and non-digital worlds to the non-fungible, which is the, you know, the next steps in um, how you're managing your cryptocurrencies to not just money, but the assets behind it that get digitalized and tokenized it again to eventually get to this metaverse uh, to make sure that you know we uh, our next step in that, which is how do we create these digital immersive spaces uh, that allows us to um, to use and bring all of this to its maximum expression. Before I do that, uh, and we go into the metaverse, uh, I'm gonna do a quick time check, uh, Mustafa, because I got very excited with it, and I know I have five minutes left. Yes, um, yes. So it, I can do two things. I can very quickly go through the metaverse in just quick two minutes uh, with just the conclusions, or I can cut it here and we can get to some questions and I will take your, uh, your cue on this. I think if you address the, you know, how does AI add value to a blockchain? If you can address that issue, Martin, then we can continue with your presentation. I think it's a, it's a fantastic sure. presentation. So, yeah. Thank you. So, um, I would say all of the, you know, AI is now most of these technologies as, you know, as I've been discussing, right? They're all interconnected and they're all embedded. So 
a lot of these um, I'm going to take a step back. Uh, one of the interesting things of uh, blockchain has to do with um, with the um, I'm thinking secure uh, privacy. Sorry, I was getting secure in my mind, but it was privacy I was going to. Uh, one of the most interesting thing about a blockchain or, or, or one of the big movements that it's bringing is around privacy and data, right? Data privacy. And one of the pillars of AI has been around uh, using the, the data that might not uh, be as available in, in some of them. But most of these things, it's a mix of, yes, you are building on the blockchain, but a lot of these are you know, automatic or uh, self-learn uh, and self-thought uh, to create this thing. So you, you can have a metaverse, you can have, you know, actual NFT platforms and so on without having the AI behind it to continue to build it, right? So I talked at the beginning from AI-driven uh, engineering, which accelerate and improving the way we uh, develop these things all the way to how uh, we are able to leverage the different um, use cases of AI and data to improve uh, the ways we use um, our blockchain use cases all the way from the cryptocurrency side to the um, metaverse in this case, but many of the other uses, I don't think you can think of one without the other. So I know in what ways it can help. Uh, I think they're, you know, enabling technologies the same way like blockchain allows the metaverse, right? It's not a direct connection. I did the whole presentation today. It took me a while to get there. But blockchain is allowing or enabling the metaverse. I think AI in a similar way is an enabler of all the things that we are discussing, of all the use cases of blockchain, right? So it's not helping with blockchain as much as it is helping with the implementation of the different use cases or realities about building uh, on that technology. Um, I'm hoping that makes sense. I don't know if that was more specific. Um, the question was kind of general, so I tried to address Thank it in that way. Thank you. All right, so uh, I have two minutes to go to the metaverse. So if we go uh, very quickly, uh, the metaverse is here. Uh, it's, it's a great phrase, it's the next one, uh, Mustafa, right? And the way we know it is because a lot of things are happening, you know, from Roblox going digital to Facebook changing its uh, brand uh, to Meta. Um, sorry, Roblox going public. I, I think I think I said digital. I meant I meant public. Uh, there's a lot of kind of these digital immersive uh, technologies uh, that are happening right now, right? And uh, what is this digital immersion going to look like in the future? Is anybody's guess? I think we're just getting uh, started uh, in here. But in a sense, uh, if we go to the next one, just because of, of time, I want to go I quickly through it. Uh, you you can say the metaverse. I put a specific example here because I think it's it, it's easy to visualize. But once you get to a fully digital immersive reality, such as a uh, shopping mall that is digital, doesn't really exist other than the virtual space. Uh, then you're going to say uh, we are uh, getting into this metaverse. That's that's basically what it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's fully digital immersive spaces uh, that you can experience. So if we go to the next slide, um, there, there there are and I can't get into all of this, right? But there's a lot of building blocks to this metaverse, and each of them is its own very interesting issue, right? But one of the most interesting is digital identities. Who, do, who are we in a digital world? Uh, tourism is making great lips uh, us of like, can you create experiences, uh, the digital experiences uh, that replicate what we do in the real world? Education, uh, we've seen it anywhere from augmented reality to fully immerse in digital uh, becomes very interesting. Obviously, we're not talking about Zoom here. We're talking about fully immersive when we're actually interacting as if in person, which creates a huge opportunity, right? Because it brings out so many borders and so on. In in, in, a, in a metaverse education war, 
we will all be speaking our own language or listening in and listening in our own language because you have you know direct translation and so on. Reza is easy to see, right? Uh, how this is going to be. The digital assets is probably what we talk the most about uh, entertainment, um, you know, digital concerts, digital uh, movie theaters, and so on. Do we need to go and so on? And then how companies are going to get uh, in here? I think I'm on time. Uh, I only got to a very little glimpse of, of the metaverse. Um, sure, sure. In the next slide, you have the, the, the technologies, and I close with this. Right, blockchain is very clear. I try to explain how AI and ML uh, is enabling uh, the metaverse, right? I can, as I said, no, can't work without it. Gaming engines uh, have been fantastic and enabling uh, because of the way uh, that they already are creating these worlds. And then the other one is the amount of data that needs to be processed and shared is crazy. So there's a huge infrastructure component uh, for this to be able to work, right? You can't just make it work as we are today. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously a 3D software, right? It's, it's something that's still evolving. Very, very early stages for this. There's a lot of interesting things uh, in here to come. Um, I'm sorry that I went a couple of minutes over. I think uh, the fine, topic fine. was just really interesting. Uh, I appreciate everybody's attention. And uh, with that, I'm gonna bend it back to you, Mustafa. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much. I knew that uh, when you accepted the invitation, I knew the audience are going to get, you know, a very, very great dosage of where tomorrow is heading. So I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we welcome you uh, to come back and, you know, visit us virtually until you can visit us in person. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, Martin. And uh, it's been just, you know, it's been amazing. And thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the presentation. Mustafa, once again, thank you so much for the invitation. And in this case, special thanks for, for the challenging uh, topic. I promise to give you more in time next time. And thank looking so forward much. for uh, seeing everybody again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. thank you so much, Martin. Have a great day. Thank you. Great. So we're gonna take a short break and then we'll, we'll come back in about seven minutes a little bit less than that, about six minutes, where we will have uh, assistant professor, Dr. Lin Lee, um, chat to us about chatbots. So take a small break and then we'll be back. Thanks everyone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us resume our program. And uh, very shortly, we'll have Dr. Lin Lee, who's an assistant professor in MIS at KBS, um, share with us some of her insights on what is driving chatbot services. And uh, she's looking at uh, the case with travel agencies. So Dr. Lin, are you ready to go? Great, yes. wonderful, wonderful. The Zoom webinar is yours. Please, please continue. Thank you, Mr. for your introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lin. So today I would like to talk about what makes you continue to use chatbot service. So first of all, let me try to share my screen. Okay. I assume you can see my slides now, right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you Great. so much. Uh, so this is relatively short. So I will make the introduction about the chatbot service and then very, very briefly talk about my research. So the reason I want to talk about chatbot is because today we're talking about the emerging technologies in business. So I was thinking what would be the technology that is very easy to be applied to our daily life and also we feel very easy to adapt to it without too much complication. So I would like to talk about chatbot in today's uh, speech. So when we talk about chatbot, maybe you will think, okay, this is very recent. Um, just in 2010, around that time, 2011, probably the time when chatbot started, but actually, this terminology goes way back to even 1921, 
So that was the time when this concept was first raised. And uh, recently, the chatbot get so popular is because the development of so many things that we are familiar with. For example, the different AI algorithms or the uh, NLP, we see the natural language processing. So with this natural language processing, chatbots are able to understand human language. So how do you understand the context information? The small nuance of our talk or how they really talk like a human. And also, of course, machine learning. Uh, because of the machine learning channels are able to learn from the data that feed to them and then forecast the results coming from the data that we feed them. And uh, this is kind of the background that make the chatbot able to be applied. So without this, maybe we don't have the development of chatbot. So it's similar with AI. So AI was also developed concept, I think in 70s or 60s. About that time, there's no technology able to support just a, a prototype, just a thought. But recently, it's able to come to life. So it's a similar case with chatbot. And also another reason for using chatbot or the development so fast, I think in the past three years, is because uh, one reason that is about cost saving. Because we all have experience that we buy something or we want to ask something from some platform, but in the results is not available at night or early in the morning or different time zones. And is in the app, we don't want to talk. We don't have time to really talk about to this uh, human agent. So if we can use chatbot, first it's very convenient for us to talk to them anytime we want. Right, also it's very easy to save money because they don't need to sleep, they don't need to eat and they don't need to day off. Right. So uh, in this case, I think that is also a practical reason that chatbot is developing really fast in the recent year. So this is the background of chatbot technology. And then let's look a little bit about, uh, oh, can you see my slide moving? Yes, we can. Okay, good. And also in this page, we can talk about the applications of chatbot. So since we talk about the development, I want to mention a little bit about the applications. So as you can see, it's being applied to different aspects. So for example, um, healthcare, because of COVID, we all know the case that the chatbot is able to uh, not necessarily treat the patient, but at least they can give some supplies to the patient because human, we worry about the infection. So chatbots, we don't have to worry of those things. It, it's, it's easier to handle. And also finance industry, we also know, for example, uh, JP Morgan or other companies, they are started to using chatbots for their like, contract or their account management. And also probably not that common now is about tourist sessions. So they already started to use chatbots for booking and reservation and also other uh, things that can be done easily by chatbot in other than the human agent. Of course, there are some aspects that cannot be done by chatbots, but still there are a lot of things that can be allocated to chatbot. So based on that, um, I have a research that is based on chatbot. More specifically, I want to examine the different quality dimensions of a chatbot service. That is understandability, uh, completeness, interactivity, and autonomy. So this is, we use to measure the service, but in this we apply to chatbot dimensions. And also we want to see how these dimensions influence user satisfaction. And in the end, leads to the continuous use intention. And also in the meanwhile, we want to see how the social anxiety moderates relationship. Because it's interesting as some people may have no difficulty to talk to humans, like interaction. Some people are relatively uh, more shy and sometimes do not really want to talk to humans. Instead, they prefer to talk to chatbots or like a human, not human to human, like human to machine interaction. So this is the brief introduction of my study. Since the time is limited, I will probably stop soon. 
So hopefully we have more chance to talk about my study in some future time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Uh, very insightful, very informative. And you know, these are things, especially chatbots we use, you know, when we're on an app, on our website, very, very, I mean, extremely, extremely effective uh, and very, very, you know, cost effective also. So thanks so much. Uh, appreciate that. Thank um, you. What we can do, you're most welcome, most welcome. I'll monitor the chats and if there's anything uh, question wise, you know, we have, we do have a minute or so. So um, there's a question in the chat regarding which chat provide, chatbot provider in the market has the highest accuracy in mimicking human language. Okay. Like to, yeah? uh, first, thank you for the question. Um, Actually, recently there are a lot of chatbots companies are starting to get more accuracy. But personally, I feel the chatbot service that has some connection to Google uh, relatively has higher development because uh, we know that um, in the human language, the difficult thing is there are some small nuance in our talk that is difficult for machines to detect. Like they are have difficulty to really determine what things are really the key information in our speech. Because in Google, they have relatively huge data set. So they are able to have more data to be trained. So as a result, their accuracy of their chatbots are relatively higher. And uh, also some other related aspects um, also relatively higher in the current marketplace. Okay. Wonderful. Well, if we have any other questions, we will definitely uh, get them to you. So I'll have you stop sharing now. Okay. And thank oh, you. Thank you for stop me sharing. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, now we will have uh, Dr. Musa Al Bashrawi. Welcome, Musa. Uh, welcome to your webinar, because this is sponsored by your, um, and let me introduce you, Dr. Dr. Musa is the assistant uh, professor in MIS, in KBS, and he's also the director for the Interdisciplinary Research Center for Finance and Digital Economy, which is the co-organizer for today's webinar, along with the Department of IS and Operations Management where we are colleagues and uh, working together. So Dr. Musa, please, it's your, it's your webinar now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Mustafa. And uh, I'm pleased to be here with you all. So the uh, screen is clear, all can see it? Screen is clear, yes. Okay, it's great, let's start. So uh, this is a published project uh, uh, where, and it is actually interesting uh, paper that I did where we combine uh, the behavioral side uh, of uh, studying technology with analytical or with, analy with analytics. Uh, here, we try to investigate the mobile banking system sexes and we are investigating this through a uh, clustering perspective. As an, uh, as an outline, uh, I will go very quick on the motivation, then method we used, uh, yeah, k-means clustering, um, some description about the, the, uh, the method and technique, and I'm going to show you the research model, then we will present the results. Uh, for the sake of time, there was no time to talk about literature review and the, uh, the gaps on this area. So the motivation, uh, in our study, we, we try or we try to apply the ISXS model, what's called by Dillon and Macklin model. And basically this model has a three, three pillars, what we call quality pillars, system quality, information quality, and service quality. And those are, as in the Dillon and Macklin mod model, would affect and influence the user investigation or the user, sorry, uh, satisfaction of using technology that will lead uh, to intention to use and actual use. Uh, 
for our motivation, we were driven by a practical one and a theoretical one. For a practical one, we believe there is no what's what's called one size fits all. Since, and especially in mobile banking, uh, people when they use their mobile banking app, they are different on their usage level. So if you try to just generalize what you find, uh, maybe from the survey or from data analysis, on all your uh, customer, this is might not really work. So here we we know there's active user and there's passive users, and we try to just segment those user into different homogeneous groups where we can provide them uh, services that would fit their needs and literally it's gonna serve and improve the, the banking services. From the theoretical side, um, please, uh, if I'm going out of any of time, please let me know. Or if there is like three, four, four minutes remaining, please let me know so I could speed uh, my talk. Uh, as of, from a theoretical side, literature literature that uh, we uh, reviewed suggested uh, they they could be what's called an observed heterogeneity bias. And this is usually uh, becoming apparent when you try to measure system success and system usage. If you are using one sample for the whole analysis. So to avoid this and to detect, actually to detect this, we try to create a homogeneous groups. Uh, so we, we use clustering to do so and uh, the, our data we collected from a local mid-sized bank in the northeastern region of the US, and we were able to obtain like 472 mobile banking users. Once we did, we make sure all validity and reliability checks are good before moving to cluster. So we use the K-means. K-means basically it is a unsupervised learning algorithm that being used a lot in different sectors. Uh, like even if you wanted to cluster sales or you people who are active, maybe passive, or maybe let's say low on their sales, or you could even cluster people on their demographics or other characteristics. Here in the mobile banking, we use K-means clustering uh, to divide uh, the mobile banking user, uh, or not divide actually. We use two attributes and feed them to the algorithm just to make sure what outcomes that we would have. We use the usage of frequency, uh, for example, number of transfer and the number of deposits, uh, basically the usage part. And then we use another attribute, the US dollar amount. So number of transfer, how much was transferred? Number of deposits, how much was deposited? And so on. And we ended up with the three homogeneous clusters. And those clusters, they are different in size. Like we, uh, let, let me show him, let me show the clusters here. Uh, and we could uh, get the whole or more understandable uh picture like uh, we have three clusters from k-means and based again on two attributes and the usage of frequency and a dollars amount used and for uh, the unsupervised learning algorithm it doesn't give you a predefined outcome it gives you an outcome and you would just give it a good interpretation based on your domain, domain knowledge so uh, so here we uh, have those K-means uh, results and we get to interpret the blue as heavy users because they are more uh, on the high usage of usage and dollars amount. And the, the green uh, segment or cluster, we define them as a moderate users because they are between and uh, here the red or yeah, the red ones they are those delight users. And again, it's because of the, their uh, low usage on both attributes. And we, uh, based on this clustering, we uh, developed this model 
as a full sample and light user segment, moderate user, and heavy users. Uh, once we have this developed, we tested through structural equation modeling to see how different from the, from, uh, from the side, we could look at full sample and see how it being different from moderate, heavy, and light user. For example, here you have full sample and it seems all factors are significant, but are really they are significant since if I'm looking at heavy users, I see service quality is not that significant for heavy users. So those heavy users already have quality established there and the bank should giving more emphasis on system quality and information quality. And you, when you compare between uh, like moderate users and light users, you see information quality for light user more important than moderate users. And this is doesn't show there in the full sample. So this is make, made us to believe uh, segmenting the users into different cluster would enable banks to give them services uh, that meet their needs. And this is will uh, reflect back on, on the customer satisfaction and on the bank sales and uh, even customer retention. That's it for my, for my presentation. For my presentation, thank you all for listening, and I would be happy to answer uh, your questions. Thank you, Musa. Uh, great timing, <laughs> fantastic timing, great stuff. Uh, thanks for sharing the invites, uh, your insights also, and um, appreciate your invitation to all the panel members and to the audience. And we hope that you know this is first of many. Uh, such webinars. So thanks for sharing that. And um, we have a minute for, for some questions. If, if any of the audience has any questions, uh, please do share. And plus I'm monitoring the chat. So if there's anything you'd like to ask later on, please go ahead and we could we could definitely address that. Okay, thanks for doing that. Thank you. So we are on track, just about a minute or so. So um, like to like to welcome Dr. Nicholas Berente, who's joining us from from also from North America. Let me just grab my okay. Good morning, Dr. Nicholas. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. This is exciting. And thanks for joining us. It's, uh, well, at least now it's 10 a.m., I think, around 10 a.m. your time? Yeah, 9.20. So. 9.20, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Well, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, he's an associate professor in IT at Notre Dame in, in Indiana. Correct. And he's with Nota Business School. So, Dr. Nicholas, uh, thank you so much for taking time out and joining us uh, from across the, across the oceans. And the beauty of technology is exactly that. We can, we can connect up um, and have these wonderful sessions. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you in person whenever you can. Do visit us, please. And until then, um, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. So the Zoom floor is yours. So please, uh, I'll go ahead and start. Right. I, I so wonder if I could uh, share my screen. Would that... uh, you should be able to, yes, Dr. Nicholas, you should be able to. All right, so you see my screen now. There you correct? go. Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, again, good afternoon, and thank you very much for uh, uh, asking me to uh, to join and speak about managing a uh, AI. I'm honored by the invitation, and uh, you did mention University of Notre Dame, and that's where I am. This we're, we're known for the beauty of our campus, as you see there, and also our football team and our marching band. We're the Irish, of course collegiate marching band so and and if you want to know where we are uh, a good way of thinking about us is chicago is right there in the middle of the country we're just a little bit east of chicago in the next state indiana where chicago is in illinois so uh and we're, we're the fighting irish but <laughs> you're not here to learn about uh the university of notre dame but what i will do is talk to you about management issues at ai everybody talks about the technology 
and the technology is certainly one of the major things that is that is happening uh, everywhere. But the question then becomes, well, as managers and as management researchers, what, how does it change what we do? And we actually ran a special issue with a few of my colleagues, uh, Bingu at Boston University, Jan Recker at the University of Hamburg and Radhika Santhanam at uh, University of Oklahoma. And we spent about the last two years thinking about nothing but this, right? Managing artificial intelligence. So, so what I'm going to do now is as uh, Professor uh, Mustafa mentioned way at the beginning of this webinar, you know, we're, we're at the early stages of a revolution. You can almost think of it as the beginning of in the 1800s for the industrial age, right? Uh, we, we're only at the beginning. So we're making that history. We're learning as we go. So there's actually not that much research on how to manage artificial intelligence yet. And that's what I'd like to talk about. Not This isn't a consultant giving you pop wisdom. This is a, a management researcher looking at uh, the existing research and saying, okay, what do we know? And what are the interesting things around artificial intelligence? And whether you're a practitioner, whether you're a researcher, if you're a researcher, Hopefully, uh, this talk will give you a couple of ideas on where to maybe investigate and maybe a couple of the citations. So what I'll do is I'll have the citations running on the bottom of the presentation. So I might not spend too much time on any given study, but you know I can, of course, circulate these. Uh, uh, Professor Mustafa, I can send it to you afterwards and you can and people can grab the citations if they'd like. Thank right? you. Thank you very much. But, uh, but we can... Uh, start, we do need to address the topic just a little bit. What is artificial intelligence? Uh, the father of artificial intelligence, John McCarthy out of Stanford back in 1955 uh, with Marvin Minsky, uh, along with, you know, Herb Simon and a whole bunch of other people created the first, this is where they coined the term artificial intelligence in the proposal for that Dartmouth conference. And, uh, and with the first definition of artificial intelligence is making a machine behave in ways that would be called intelligent if a human were so behaving. Okay, so, so that's how McCarthy put it. Uh, and then many years later, he started realizing, wait a second, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. <laughs> it's this funny thing, isn't it? Where the things they thought were AI when they got started, as soon as it worked, and as soon as people were using it, they didn't call it AI anymore. They just called it IT or a computer or an algorithm, right? Uh, so what we did in our special issue introduction is we argued that AI is actually not a thing. <laughs> AI has been around forever, right? We're in the third generation of AI right now. So when we think of machine learning technologies, which we currently talk about with AI, that's the current incarnation. In the 80s, it was, uh, it was expert systems in the 80s and early 90s. And then before that, it was basically computer programs, right? Uh, so really what AI is, it's the frontier of computational advancement. The moment it becomes commonly accepted, we no longer call it AI, we just call it whatever it is, right? An expert system or something like that, right? And what happens with, with uh, computational advancements, they advance in two different areas. The first dimension is scope. So it used to be applied only maybe in online systems, then it was only uh, in autonomous vehicles, and then it was only uh, but it was very similar technology being applied more and more broadly, right? So we call that the frontier of scope. When well-established computing technologies hit new domains, it, it moves the technology forward. And then there's, of course, the dimension of performance, which is, okay, we're getting faster computers, we're getting uh, better neural nets and deep uh, neural nets and all sorts of things. So, so we're actually improving our performance for the same application. So in applications where we use AI, we improve performance, we also spread it around, and that's the expanding frontier of AI. So that's really our argument, that you can't talk about managing a thing and then being done with it. You have to manage this dynamic frontier. That's the key. And of course, there's this kind of engine of, uh, of autonomy and scrutability and learning that I'll get into in a moment. But uh, if we go back, so, so just to, to spend another second on... Uh, and what is AI? The original kind of formulation in the 80s was uh, Russell and Norvig's formulation. And you can get the PDF of this book online, but they actually reviewed all the literature on AI at that point. And they said there are different ways to think about what AI is. And they had this idea of acting humanly, thinking humanly, thinking rationally, and acting rationally. So rational is better than human, uh, right? And, and what they decided their goal 
for AI going forward is constructing rational agents, right? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, when I work with uh, executives, when I work with uh, students, sometimes uh, we think through how exactly they want to use AI and we categorize it. <clears throat> so it's less about the technologies themselves. It's more about what you want the technology to do. Uh, do you want it to do something a human does? Do you want it to do something better than a human does, right? And then, of course, you can think of all the different technologies that are out there. Uh, I use procedural generation. This is, we do some research with Ubisoft and, and their Ghost Recon Wildlands game where they pretty much model the entire country of Bolivia in a video game. And they use procedural generation tools and some other tools there to, to do that. You know, no human can do that. Uh, you'd need an army of humans to detail all the bushes that they have in that video game, right? Uh, like a human, you know, it's very easy for us. Uh, computer vision, right, is trying to imitate what we do very naturally, which, you know, is if see things and, and be able to discern one thing from another, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, so you could think of AI is falling into these buckets, and then you want to start thinking not in terms of the specific technology, but start thinking in terms of what you want done. And whether you want it better than human or do you want to uh, mimic what a human does, either acting or uh, its cognition, right? And, and that's the first place to start thinking uh, about AI. But let's go back to the frontier uh, of advancement, the engine that drives the frontier. And this is what we thought. So, so this is the problem. If, if AI is just the current wave of computing advancements, well, then managing AI is the same thing as managing computing. Right, so there's no difference. That's the issue. Is that well? I, what is it? Just IT management? Well, the answer is no. It's not just IT management because there are three fundamental differences that are uh, in in at least this particular generation of AI, which is machine learning technologies. Right, there are three fundamental differences, and, and we can only imagine that is you know machine learning is the current paradigm. Whatever we do in the future is just going to get, going to get take this machine learning paradigm even deeper, right? And there are three elements to this machine learning paradigm that distinguish it from previous generations of IT. And that's uh, autonomy, uh, learning, and inscrutability. It learns on its own, it acts on its own, and because it's learning on its own and acting on its own, it's unintelligible. We don't know what it's doing. We have to learn. So this idea of learning runs through so much of, of uh, the topics when we think about managing AI, right? Not only the machine learning, but we have to learn not only about the machine, but also about how to deal with the machine, right? So, so this idea of learning is super, super important. And, and I'm going to get into some of that uh, uh, research right now. So, so that's what we're going to get into. And I'll just do six lessons. We can... I, I mean, I could probably spend the next three hours talking about it. I'll try to go through it fairly quickly, but it's just six quick lessons. I'll point to a couple of key current papers and, uh, and just let you know that this is at the beginning of me making sense of this. I've been doing it for two years. I plan to do it the next couple of years. I don't know what I'll do with this, but, but uh, I'm trying to organize existing research in such a way that we can start creating this uh, little body of knowledge around uh, managing at the uh, frontier of AI, right? What, what, what's different? And, and I think one, and sorry if I get a little conceptual and scattered here, but one of the things that's different is that uh, we're used to dealing with technology, including early generations of machine learning. Uh, it, it wasn't that big of a deal because it was always human bracketed. So management was essentially managing humans. Uh, we had technologies, but those technologies were always in support of human interactions. We always kind of had humans at the bookends. There was always a human manager somewhere that was eventually the, uh, the, uh, uh, the decision maker. There was always maybe a, a human with your customer and with your supplier that you could you know, kind of be the, uh, the mechanism of last resort, right? So whatever we did with computing, and if we did EDI, which was automatic, you know, electronic data interchange back in the 90s, we still had humans on both sides, making sure it worked really well, and you had a support desk and everything, right? So, so we call that human bracketing. And we were able to kind of uh, control our technologies, because they were always kind of bookended by humans, right? Uh, the bracketing. So management issues were managing humans. So you see where I'm heading with this, right? Uh, if our entire management paradigm was always around managing humans and we had technologies, but the technologies were there to support and, and be delegated from humans, right? Uh, 
we understood management and we understood technology. And of course you see where I'm going and that's that, well, except that that's not happening now. Look at Uber, <clears throat> nobody at Uber is deciding who gets assigned which route and how they're assigning the routes, right? And here's a study where they looked at algorithmic management of, uh, at Uber. And, and this is one of those frontiers of, okay, we have to figure this out because if we're now dealing with humans that are algorithmically bracketed rather than the reverse, there's something fundamentally different here. And, and in this paper, they talk about, you know, the two main, <clears throat> excuse me, the two main things that are happening with, with algorithmic uh, uh, bracketing, what, what algorithms do that don't have human oversight are the idea of matching and control, right? And they get into it a little bit. But what they're pointing out is that humans have different responses to the, when they're managed by algorithms than when they're managed by people. Right, there are tensions associated with this, and they they described three tensions. Right, they talked about execution, compensation, and belonging. Right, uh, when you're not dealing with a, a human that's giving you orders, you trust it less. You want to scrutinize it. You want to question it more. Uh, you're you're you'll circumvent it even more than you would if it were, say, a, a manager. Right, and there are tremendous, tremendous. If you look at the research around. Uh, humans dealing with uh, essentially algorithms that are managing them. Trust is a huge, huge issue. So uh, that's one of the big issues right there is that if algorithms are bracketing you, then uh, you'll respond differently. And here's a, a study that, I'm, that, that we're, we're doing and we're looking at online communities. So it's not just in organizations, it's in the online world. And so much more of our lives are, are spent online. You know, we had the, the talk earlier about the metaverse, right? Uh, and, and, and we had the other talk earlier about chatbots. Uh, these online bots are doing more and more of the coordination of our online activity. And we looked at Reddit, for example, and we just looked at three years and the number of online bots in Reddit <clears throat> multiplied by 10. And what it's doing is, well, there are different kinds of bots, of course, and these different kinds of bots have much different ways that they impact how humans actually interact with each other. We find that certain types of bots make it so humans interact less deeply with each other. When you include certain types of bots online, uh, you know, that human-to-human -human interaction goes down. Uh, the, the depth of the human-human interaction. However, the breadth of the human interaction goes up. You can talk to more people. I can communicate with folks in, uh, on the other side of the planet, right? And, uh, but I focus, I, I interact less deeply with you uh, and, and bots exacerbate this, uh, this element of virtual. So what's the first lesson that AI bracketing, right? When we take this, this, this frontier of algorithms and we bracket it, it changes human interaction and human experience and creates tensions. And these, and the whole point is that these are different than when they're bracketed by humans. So that's first great insight. And, and we don't know how exactly, we're just getting those initial uh, glimpses into what it's doing. And this would be a great stream of, uh, of research. Second thing has to do with augmentation. And there are a handful of papers right now in the management literature on uh, humans, augmenting machines, right? And this is certainly from a fairness standpoint. Anytime you see any paper on fairness, and we have one in our special issue that you see cited here, uh, they always say, well, there's no answer to fairness. You can never make an algorithm perfectly fair. And the, and the reason you can't make an algorithm perfectly fair is that it depends on how you define fairness. Is fairness equity or is it equality, right? Those are the first two. Uh, you know, is, uh, are we going to try and keep outcomes the same or are we going to try and hold everyone to the same standard? And the moment you choose one definition of fairness versus the other definition of fairness, they're no longer compatible with each other. You're always going to err on the one side versus the other. So, so any machine learning, and there are you know, dozens of definitions of fairness and all that, they, they can never solve it once and for all mathematically. So they always say we need a human to augment us, right? And then similarly, we say machines can augment humans. And, uh, and that could be, you know, for example, uh, humans can't process a whole bunch of information very quickly, or maybe humans are biased. You know, this is the famous judge issue where, where we thought we could take algorithms and use algorithms to make judges less biased, right? So humans can augment machines, machines can augment humans. And, and there's even some recent research on teams where you know, you look at uh, machines augmenting teams, autonomous machines, and similarly teams uh, 
augmenting uh, machines and sets of machines. So, so this is a frontier of understanding, and, and we frankly don't understand it, right? We're still early. This particular paper talks about four different ways that this augmentation, and they, they focused on the fairness issue, but you know, this can be more broadly uh, uh, generalized to, to think in terms of, uh, okay, so you have your uh, decision, is the decision maker a human or a machine? And then is the, uh, the problem difficulty high or low? And then they, they uh, play with a, a number of different ways of, of thinking about how you might manage in these different situations, right? But again, this is a baseline, it's a frontier. Uh, and I think the key takeaway that we know right now is that augmentation can help with the downsides of either human or an AI. There are downsides to being human, there are downsides to being AI, and the one can augment the other and vice versa. And we're just tip, touching the tip of the iceberg on augmentation. So the second big issue. Third big issue is if we're going to augment, right? Uh, we need to understand, right? If we're gonna do something with uh, machine, we need to learn about machine learning. At one point, we need to learn what the algorithm does. If we're gonna figure out how to augment it, what its limitations are, we need to understand it. So certainly from ethics, right? A lot of uh, bias, fairness, accountability, justifiability, contestability, all requires, you know, what they usually call explainable AI. Uh, Application domains, if we know how we're going to apply it, we need to know how it works, right? If we're going to improve it, we need to know how it works, right? So a lot of the research around uh, AI and around managing and human interaction with AI is all about learning about the machine learning, okay? Um, you call it interpretability, explainability, that sort of thing. And, and, it's, uh, and, and what we did is we, uh, we said the biggest issue here is that it's inscrutable, you can't really learn it. <laughs> All right. So, so that's a problem. So, so we're starting to do a little digging and we started this in that special issue. Uh, but, but I actually have another research project where we're really unpacking it. And what we realized is that to go from the, the algorithm to the human, there's really a number of different steps in this chain of interpretation. And each of these steps has a much different, uh, uh, set of demands, right? Opacity is something about the algorithm and algorithm is, 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 uh, uh, more or less opaque. And transparency is very similar to opacity. It, it depends on opacity, but then it's a strategic decision. All right. It, you decide what you might uh, uh, show versus what you don't. And then explainability, it's no longer just about the algorithm. It's about the algorithm interacting with its context, its reasons, right? So, so that's explainability. And interpretability has to do with the human. Uh, you know, different people can interpret different things. Uh, some of you, if I show you the algorithms of a function in nodes in a neural net, you'd, you'd understand that to some extent, right? Uh, others would have no idea what I'm showing them, right? So, so different humans have different, and, and then for different reasons, right? If, if I am doing, if I need to scrutinize the algorithm just to get a vague idea of the weights it puts on different uh, inputs, then I don't need much detail. I just need maybe those weights. Whereas if I, if I wanted to, you know, troubleshoot and optimize it, I might need a little more, a little more detail. Or if I just want a general intuition of the top, top three weights, I might want to uh, put it in some way for the general public, right? So the interpretability really depends on how the person uh, who's in, in, in what they're doing and, uh, and, and why they need the information, right? So each of these steps we call chains of interpretation and, and, uh, and it's, it's really problematic. Each of these steps has its own uh, different set of uh, issues. So that's kind of insight number three. This intelligibility requires different chains of interpretations for different purposes. And if you look at research here, uh, understanding what types of you know, interpretation or representation of the algorithm you need for different purposes is still a frontier. We don't understand this. This, isn't, this doesn't exist, right? Uh, and when you think of different purposes, some of our research, uh, and here's one study where we looked at, and, and again, we look at uh, Ubisoft Ghost Recon Wildland, but we also looked at Intel and a few other contexts in this paper. And we basically said that one of the purposes people need to understand the algorithm is when they're doing design. So in this particular case, you know, I mentioned they use procedural tools in Ghost Recon Wildland before. Uh, they automatically built a road. Uh, to cover the mountain so that people can go up and down the road and you can drive up and down the road uh, in this mountain that was automatically generated. Well, no designer <clears throat> knows what logic it used for that road. So if I want to improve the road, I need to pay attention to how it created the road. 
So the, what the Ubisoft designers do is they just do experimentation. They, they play with settings, parameterization, they look at it, they adjust those settings, and they, they, they follow this process, this iterative process of experimentation to understand what the, uh, what the procedural generation tools are doing, what the autonomous tools are doing. And then once they kind of have a feel, then they use that on the other mountains, right? And we call this triple loop learning. It's not just about in the old days, a designer would design, look at their design, learn about what they're trying to do and then redesign. Now that's happening, but they need to understand the mental model of the autonomous tool. They need to understand its model, basically, uh, why it's doing what it's doing in order to apply that tool elsewhere. So there's this process. And again, we go back to management, managing uh, an AI enabled design process is a different thing than managing a typical design process. And it's because of this triple loop learning. Okay. Uh, and then there's another study in our special, special issue where they looked at uh, training uh, and, and, and working with uh, AI tools for hiring, right? for selecting people. And they found a whole bunch of things. It's a really fascinating paper. But uh, what they found was when humans are dealing with these tools, they actually make decisions about excluding information. They actually withhold information in training the model because they think that's our purview, right? This is what humans should be doing, all right? They make a lot of decisions. Uh, they, they identify in this paper three problems, the data selection problem, frame problem, mismatch problem. These are limitations of machine learning. It, it doesn't know which data to train itself on. It doesn't know how to apply itself. So what you end up doing is having human decision. That's the frame problem. Uh, the frame problem is if you... If you uh, apply, uh, if you train a model in one context, the model may not be uh, applicable to another context, right? And, and uh, that's one of the classic issues in AI that go back decades, right? So, so these are problems where that AI can't solve for itself. So you need humans. And what's really interesting is understanding how humans make these decisions about the data to select, about the frames, when it applies, when it doesn't, and about what to include and what to exclude they showed in this article that, you know, they're doing this stuff, but we actually don't understand, you know, very specifically how, and, and what fascinated me here is when do people exclude information from training an AI model? That, that was fascinating. And they give some stories in there, right? So, so the long and short of this is, well, human AI interaction, it involves triple lear loop learning, and there are a whole bunch of decisions to shape it. And just understanding the triple loop learning and the decisions that the chain of decisions that shape AI uh, is a is a phenomenal frontier for for uh, AI research. Another article in special issue, which I also thought was very cool, because you think about it and you think, oh, they use AI for medicine and for medical imaging, right? It's all got to be fairly similar. What this article found, and you could look at these are just four medical imaging technologies, right? Look at the variance in accuracy, right? Bone age is ninety nine percent accurate whereas brain tumors can be less than 80% accurate depending on the context, right? If you're managing imaging, you're gonna manage one much differently than another depending on the accuracy. And then you look at, and, and in this article, they spend a lot of time on ground truth and they talk about how they generated the ground truth much differently for the different uh, medical imaging technologies, right? So I look at it as a, you know, someone who maybe doesn't know deeply medical imaging. And I think, yeah, whatever. I'm sure you put imaging in a hospital, you run it very similarly. What they're finding is, no, you have to tailor the entire process, not only the learning process, but also the implementation, what you do with it based on the accuracy, even a very, very similar technology like medical imaging uh, can end up with much different kind of organizational processes. So that's something to keep in mind. And, and we need to understand what those processes are. A similar issue, and this is a study we're doing uh, where we looked into uh, some natural language processing chatbots, right? And we realized that even though it's a natural language processing chatbot, it's really made up of four different applications. Uh, there are generic applications. This might be like the small talk, the stuff that's available everywhere. There are distinctive applications. These are kind of open data, but they're very custom model. Then there's confidential, right? Selective applications, exclusive applications. And you need to navigate various dimensions of data sensitivity and domain specificity, depending on the application. And sometimes one application has multiple applications in it. And you need to navigate uh, 
these data and domain application issues, right? So again, managing issues, uh, that's that there are different AI applications and they require different things. We can't just call AI one thing. We have to actually, if we're gonna gain management insight, we're going, we, we need to start differentiating between these and we need to have a little more sophisticated understanding of how to manage different AI applications differently, right? Even if they're imaging. I mentioned earlier that learning is super important. There were a couple of articles in our special issue, fascinating stuff, an experiment and an agent-based model. Uh, but what they're basically pointing out at is, is, is that if you include AI, machine learning algorithms in organizational processes, this impacts what humans know. And it impacts pretty dramatically, uh, depending on different aspects of the AI, right? So for example, if, uh, and this is, is, is one of the articles, right? They, they point out that if you design the AI in a way that it personalizes things, you can actually increase human knowledge. That's what this right one is showing us. However, if you don't personalize it, you dumb down people, right? So this is super important to say what they found in this article is I put AI into, uh, in this case, it's like a online wisdom of the crowds kind of team. But if I just put AI in there, people kind of get dumb. They just start depending on the AI and, you know, they're, they're better, the more accurate, uh, uh, but the people begin losing, they, they don't gain knowledge, right? However, if I personalize that AI, the people actually gain knowledge. And of course, we're a little bit more accurate and it's a win-win. So we need to start understanding these sorts of things, like how we can, uh, and then in another one, you know, they looked at March's exploration, exploitation, and, and in this paper, they did some simulations. And if you remember March's original paper in 1991, was also a simulation paper. So it's kind of cool, but they said, okay, we put uh, AI in organizations and based on, and in their case, uh, again, it's a characteristic of the AI. They said if it's a high initial learning capability or a low initial learning capability on the AI. In other words, if you're using a sophisticated tool or a simple tool, and what they're basically saying is if you include simple tools, you're gonna dumb down your organization. <laughs> if you include sophisticated tools, you may improve the learning of your organization, right? So, so uh, I suggest you go look at these, but the bottom line is this, different approaches to AI in your organization will impact human knowledge differently. And AI can make us dumber and AI can make us smarter. And we're starting to figure out when it does which one. Uh, so in a nutshell, those are my six kind of domains for management issues around AI. And uh, I think I'm running up against time here, uh, but again, AI, the impact on human experiences, the value of augmentation, chains of interpretation processes, learning about AI and the behaviors in shaping AI, organizing around AI training, and then the impact of AI on human knowledge. I think these are all, right now we have some key papers and, and anyone can have an entire research trajectory in any of these areas. And then I wanna just, if you'll humor me for one minute, I'm gonna give you my two areas for the future. Uh, the first is, Adversarial learning. I think just as you know, right now we're in the age of deep learning. You know, adversarial learning is becoming more and more common. And of course, it's in, and again, I bring up Ubisoft, and they're using non-player characters, adversarial non-player characters, not just to fight you and learn, uh, but also to inspect and test their game. They're running around that Bolivian jungle and making sure that there are no problematic loops and that sorts of things. So, so adversarial learning, and, and there are many different types of adversarial learning but it's essentially your algorithm and then you have a counter algorithm. And, and this is of course used in, in security as it's number one spot, but, but it's increasingly being used uh, everywhere. And I think that adversarial learning is a different paradigm than machine learning. And just as with machine learning, we're gonna have to manage differently. I think we're gonna have to manage differently in the age of adversarial learning. And I think that's the next couple of decades and we're right at the beginning of it. And then I, you see here that, that weird looking device is a quantum computer. And a quantum computer is about the size of, of let's say, your refrigerator. Uh, they're not that big, and they have to be super cooled. But quantum computers, uh, you know, they say that when you get to a thousand qubits, which is their benchmark, you'll break encryption. So that's when you change the world when you get to a thousand qubits. And quantum computers have been around for three decades almost, right? They and but you know, three decades ago they they just ran at about a qubit, 
and they didn't make much progress and people were duct taping these things together and they're you know they're just machine pretty worthless machines with a lot of promise right uh well what's been happening in recent years is all of a sudden they're getting useful back in 2019 ibm no i'm sorry google uh was up at 50 over 50 qubits with their machine just a couple uh, in November, IBM announced it's at 120 qubits uh, with its machine. All right, so you can see us approaching. And a week after IBM announced that they're at 120 qubits, there was a team out of MIT and Harvard that announced that they can get 250 qubits out of their quantum machine. So what you're wow. seeing here is that these quantum machines are coming online. They're approaching that thousand qubit, uh, you know, what they call quantum supremacy, right? It's the breaking encryption. And when we get there, all learning is going to be adversarial learning. All program is going to be adversarial networks, right? We, and, and it's going to be quantum computer against quantum computer, not just in security and geopolitical dynamics, but also game design, metaverse design, whatever it is we're going to do, right? So, so that's one frontier that if you're really a pioneer and forward looking, you might look at adversarial, the adversarial paradigm. And then finally, uh, and these are of course kids, children working in the sweatshops of, of the industrial age in the 1800s. And you know, it took a, a decade or two to make some laws for safety, make some laws for child labor, and then it took a couple centuries for child labor to propagate throughout the world, you know, that it's pretty much illegal. And I, I imagine there's still child labor in certain little pockets of the globe here and there, right? And similar with sustainability. So what I'm pointing out here is that in the industrial age, we kind of caught up with government regulation and ethical behavior over the course of a century or two. Uh, we're right now at the beginning of the digital age. We don't have the luxury of waiting two centuries to catch up on ethics. So I actually think that because of this world of AI, there are so many ethical issues and we could have a whole separate talk on ethics if you'd like. But if you just wanna focus on the ethics of AI, I think that you could make a career, you could make multiple careers out of that. So we're again, just at the beginning, we have no good answers. So thank you. Uh, my last plug is PhD in analytics, we've just started it. We're accepting our first cohort. It's one of the most interesting, innovative and dynamic groups on the planet around, uh, around analytics. If you like some of these topics and you wanna to study them or you know people who wanna study them and are thinking about getting their PhD, tell them to come to beautiful Notre Dame uh, or reach out to me and I'll, I'll be happy to talk to them. Uh, very good. So uh, uh, shukran lakam. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nick for for a very insightful talk. Um, just looking forward to receiving your, or at least reviewing some of your papers. I think it's just uh, fascinating. Uh, great to get acquainted and thank you for your time. Um, wishing you a great day and uh, with the audience. So if there's any questions that you have, we can, uh, we can take those offline also and uh, share those with Dr. Nick and uh, I'm sure he can get back to us. It sounds great. So well, thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, everyone will take a break for 10 minutes and we'll resume at 6.06. .06. Thank you very much.
Assalamu alaikum everyone. I think it's a good time we'll restart, resume our sessions. Give just 30 seconds and we'll get 606 and then we can start. I hope that you've been enjoying our panel members so far. I think it's been very, very insightful. I'm, I'm picking up so much great, wonderful knowledge. So thanks to all the panel members that I've presented. Faraz and Makas are also here, great. This next uh, panel discussion that we're gonna have, right, which is basically titled, Creating Business Value with Emerging Technologies. So this is one that, you know, we, we handpicked this topic and we, I was very, very, when I was asked to you know, recruit uh, you know, and invite some, some panel members from the industry, it is something I was, you know, I was really looking forward to. And I, I looked at my network and just saw people that are you know, involved in digital and are passionate about the technologies you know, of, um, that are coming up. So I looked at my network and I was so, so happy to invite um, my friends. I'm so happy to be able to call them my friends. And so I, I reached out to, let me just get started, to Bukhaz Ahmed, who is the CTO at Ascendi Ventures. And Ascendi Ventures is a digital business ventures company. And uh, Bukhaz, mashallah, has a, has a very hands-on, wonderful background in the area of um, second, in the area of cloud, blockchain, AI, he's, he's very passionate about emerging technologies. And because I've been able to work with uh, Waqas, I thought, okay, he'd be, he'd be able to add tremendous value. And he has managed some of the, some of the largest electronic commerce sites. And I mentioned this earlier on, such as gap.com, macy's.com. So he brings a world of uh, technological experience that he has built uh, and he's backed some of the you know, largest e-commerce sites. So thank you so much Bukas, for uh, joining us and accepting our invitation uh, to share with us your insights from the field as to say, thank you so much. You are welcome, Dr. Mustafa. Thank, thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you so much. And uh, our own, one of our own, um, is um, is a dear alumnus from from KBS, right? So uh, Firas Nasir, who who graduated. Firas, you have to correct me. Did you graduate in two thousand six? Or yes, correct, two thousand six. Two thousand six. Okay, so I'm not losing my memory. That's great. So I remember. I remember. I have so many fond memories of Firas. Mashallah, Allah. When um, he was taking e-commerce e classes with me. He took basic e-commerce and the e-commerce project. And mashallah, one thing I always remember at Firas is that he was quite ahead of his peers, right? He was talking to me about XML solutions that he wanted to implement. So I've always had, you know, always kept in touch with him. Just wonderful, wonderful person in the industry. Firas and his family are doing, I think, wonderful things here in the, king, in the kingdom. And, uh, and for us, always has had a very entrepreneurial background. So when I was asked to find, you know, found people that are from the industry, I wanted to, you know, so I said, you know, I don't have to look far. So for us, welcome back. And mashallah, mabruk on your uh, recent AI degree from KFPM. Alf mabruk, mashallah, well, well done. And um, so thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, a third member, Patrick Witwer, who's a serial entrepreneur from Switzerland. And uh, mashallah, he's an entrepreneur in the space of insurtech, in blockchain, and in property tech. I had the pleasure of meeting Patrick before the pandemic at a blockchain hackathon in, uh, in um, Solothurn in Switzerland. So, and he has done, he's done really, really good work on the blockchain side. So I want to reach out to him. Uh, Patrick is not able to join us today. He, 
last couple of days he's been battling a case of case of COVID-19 and uh, we wish him the very best and we wish our uh, Dean Dr. Hisham Bardad also the very best. So both are under the weather because of this um, virus and we wish them both excellent, excellent success. And Melis want to give them better health than they had before. I mean, you know. So Patrick will not be joining us, but I know that we'll have wonderful conversations. And when I asked um, brothers Wakas and Fras, you know, it's just a fireside chat. So like, as if we're going to basically, you know, be talking over a coffee. Um, so that's our agenda. Agenda is to basically look at, you know, issues and things that they're facing in the, in the industry and coming up with, you know, their solutions. So, and because Firas Mashallah Barakala, he's the chief operating officer at Zid.sa, which is a pioneering uh, e-commerce platform here in Saudi Arabia. Um, I know he is, you know, he is very, very passionate about electronic, about electronic commerce from when he was a student of ours and also in the AI space. But I know that, you know, maybe he's not going to share with us. Um, some of his the competitive advantages that Zid has with AI, but uh, whatever he, he can share, I'm sure you know it would be, be very enlightening for for us all. So, um, you know, I'd like to maybe just start off with just mentioning, you know, that we are at a pretty pretty amazing time, Alhamdulillah, because we were at a time where, you know, if I go back to my career when I first started many many years ago, it was the birth of the web, early early 90s. Um, so Alhamdulillah, I've been very, very blessed to be able to get involved in the early days. And fast forward now, SubhanAllah, maybe, yeah, 30 years, pretty much. 92 is when I started. So 30 years. Now we have not only the web and the internet, but all the wonderful technologies. And this way, emerging technologies comes in. So as it was mentioned, 24 years it has taken for, you know, for the internet, the web to be uh, 3 billion plus users. And now we have, over the years, access to technology such as blockchain and AI and data analytics. Right? So this allows us to build you know, next gen stuff, right? next generation of, uh, of technologies that will power and that are already powering you know, um, apps and solutions and so many technologies that we use from a lot start to mention the different applications that we use, but a lot of them are already starting to use these very, very interesting uh, technologies of tomorrow. So we're very, you no, know, Alhamdulillah, I mean, it's, I feel very blessed that I get to um, be able to teach this, first of all, and that I'm talking to our friends that are practitioners in this space. So Alhamdulillah, um, very, very great time, Alhamdulillah, just as a reminder for us, in terms of Saudi Arabia, you know, I look at the Saudi 2030 vision, Saudi Vision 2030, and the opportunity it brings the budding entrepreneurs and the people of Saudi Arabia, and even you know, companies from around the world that are looking to set up their HQ in Riyadh. Um, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I've been saying this for 20 plus years when I've been teaching, but now definitely it's a very, very, it's the best time ever because of all the ecosystem for entrepreneurship is in place. Um, and these emerging technologies can empower, you know, budding entrepreneurs and also um, people that are looking to expand, extend their platforms. And this is where I think, you know, uh, both Brothers Bakas and Faras will add a lot of value. So I'll, I'll open the floor up for, you know, for our speakers to um, maybe for us, we'll start with you, just to you know, share your insights for us in terms of you know, um, your perception and your tool set that you have in emerging technologies. Um, anything you'd like to share as your insights, and then I'll share the same with uh, Brother Waqas, he can share with us. And then we'll have our discussions on, on some topics for us. So we'd like to start with just uh, how excited are you when it comes to emerging tech and uh, whatever you can share, that'll be great. Uh, as long as it's not, you know, company secrets. So if you could do that. 
Um, alaikum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for uh, um, having me today here and uh, uh, dedicating uh, some of your time of the day uh, joining us in this webinar. Um, it's uh, truly an excitement uh, period that we are living in today, uh, both uh, in the region, in Saudi Arabia and around the globe. I think the um, the amount of changes that is happening around us is, is uh, helping us to uh, venture into exciting area. Uh, the technology is rapidly uh, um, changing, as we saw with our first speaker when he showed us the hype, the technologies, the emerging technology. Every day you hear about a new thing that is coming up and a new exciting technology. Um, I believe today in Saudi Arabia, uh, we're living in a period that is, I could consider it as the golden period. Um, 20 years back, uh, I remember when uh, I started uh, working in a couple of uh, IT company, which that provides uh, 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 technology solutions between hospitals and insurance company back in the days. Um, that was maybe around um, 2003, 2002. Um, we faced a lot of struggle in, in terms of adopting to the technology, in terms of the, uh, the infrastructure, in terms of funding. Um, it took us years and years uh, uh, to achieve uh, something with our business. Uh, fast forward, uh, nowadays, um, you would find companies that within one year or two years, they are a multi-million uh, dollar uh, worth of, of, of companies. Um, it's all because of the uh, access to talent, uh, access to fund, and also access to uh, opportunity. Uh, I believe uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, um, a, um, a very uh, large uh, green uh, space where you could uh, uh, innovate and, 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 and develop a business, a company. Uh, today, we have so many sectors and in industry um, that needs uh, uh, to be revamped. Um, still, uh, if you could check, for example, the banking industry, uh, if you check the real estate industry, uh, the financial sector, all these industries, uh, a lot of companies are booming and, and taking these old services, old infrastructure, and they're introducing it. Today, one of the wonderful things that when you want to start a company, um, other than having access to talent and access to, to funds, uh, today access to knowledge, which is a very important uh, piece of, 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 uh, of, of resource that you need in order to learn more, to develop yourself. Uh, so all what I could say today, we're living in a golden area, so a golden age. Uh, and if, if, if no one really capitalizes on this, and starts his business, then he's missing out a lot. Thanks so much for us. You you just echoed uh, what we've been saying in classes. So thank you so much, especially when they hear it from one of their own, because um, you are you were a student out for hours and uh, from the industry. Hopefully, this amplifies our message clearly. So thank you so much for uh, for mentioning that. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Bukhas, How? Share some insights, please, because you, mashallah, also are a very hands-on person, mashallah. You are a, a technical guru, as I've mentioned to you quite a, quite a few times. Um, what, what, what are you excited about as, you, as we move into this interesting times? Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum to, uh, to everyone. And uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mustafa and KFUPM for inviting me to this exciting webinar. Um, I'm glad to be here and to meet great people. Uh, just a little bit about my work at Ascend eVentures. Uh, being a CTO of the company, uh, my work is to tackle some complex technology issues. Uh, I have to be abreast with latest technologies and indulge myself in research and development, as you have mentioned already, uh, so that we can better serve our business clients. At Ascend, we are basically developing business applications uh, with cutting edge technologies to provide solutions to our clients. Uh, we are experimenting with new stuff uh, like Metaverse and uh, developing customer engagement platforms through augmented reality and VR. Uh, with my experience in emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, and extended reality, uh, what I have seen that these are providing much better value to business and uh, 
yielding good amount of ROI. I think emerging technologies uh, in this era are all interconnected. The modularity and uh, plug and play nature of tools and techniques helps us solve bigger challenges. Uh, this also basically keeps us focused on the bigger picture as well. Uh, the cloud infrastructure has helped us a lot and uh, basically it has shortened our development time. Uh, the combining of the puzzle pieces from one technology to another uh, basically excites me most. Uh, since I have a limited time, I would just focus on extended reality for now, uh, which is basically an umbrella term uh, for augmented reality, virtual reality, and uh, metaverse. An important point to consider is that extended reality only is expected to be a $1 trillion industry in the near future. So it can be a game changer for the business. Uh, we can do with what we can do with extended reality is you can do a lot of big things, you can do small things, depending on the nature of your job, depending on the industry or domain you are working with. Just to mention a few of them, uh, like if you are doing a product development in which we are basically creating designs and prototypes and making adjustments uh, before producing a physical product, uh, we can use VR with impressive collaborations, reviews and experiences. Uh, extended reality can be used in architecture, engineering and construction, uh, basically in which we are designing complex structures or immersing our clients in uh, true to scale walkthroughs. XR can basically narrow down our development cycles and transform our workflows. Uh, in, the, in the domain of training, uh, we can do high risk uh, safety simulations and maintenance procedures. Uh, we can do trainings in soft skills as well, like public speaking and uh, similar stuff. Uh, it has been studied that VR enables seven times more retention than traditional lecture style learning. So as Faraz mentioned, it's a great time to be here. And with these emerging technologies uh, coming to power and uh, utilizing them to the fully extent, I think uh, the future is good. And uh, to benefit from, the, uh, from these emerging technologies would create a bigger ROI for the upcoming businesses. I think so. And it's, I'm so glad that you both uh, agree on this point that, you know, I think some of the best days for entrepreneurs, specifically in Saudi Arabia, are definitely ahead. And again, I'll ask any of my students, and I think I mentioned this maybe at least once a class time, you know, just to remind them, right, why, when you are studying these technologies and, you know, these, uh, these areas, because I teach e-commerce and blockchain, they should be able to apply these, they should be able to apply these um, locally, right? And we encourage them. And again, I would, I'd love your insights. Um, you know, what you would advise the budding entrepreneurs and students, right, on gaining knowledge. And I think that's something we can we can definitely come back to as our discussions uh, go through. One of the areas, you know, um, if the pandemic, Mel Aswantala, protect us all and our families from this, uh, I mean, it has taught business environments is one thing is that it puts digital on every CIOs, CTOs, or anybody in the C-suite on top of their to-do list and their agendas. You know, um, and I'll talk about it, you both are dealing with, you know, um, high powered, you know, at, at top management. Um, advices for them, you know, what would you advise them for us, for example, you know, um, when chambers of commerce meets and you have top management meetup, I'm sure, you know, crafting a digital strategy is something very important for them because they, they hear about it, you know, they attend webinars and, you know, and when they speak to their peers and other fellow CEOs, it is something, you know, they hear about. Where would you advise them? You know, what would you advise them in doing in terms of, you know, if they're to implement uh, emerging technologies, is it for every organization? Uh, or there are there certain things that you would advise them to um, look into when it comes to these fascinating technologies? Uh, Firas, maybe you could address an issue there. Um, today, I believe um, 
a lot of the cutting edge technology sometimes um, are not fully mature or um, it's not ready uh, to create an immediate value. Um, so adopting those technology uh, takes a lot of guts and, and, and uh, risk taking where uh, you are open to explore uh, uh, those uh, areas and try to apply them in your business. Uh, but one thing that I could assure you that the uh, digital transformation is an area that uh, all organizations need to uh, ensure that they have it as part of their strategy. Um, as you mentioned, uh, um, regarding the pandemic, uh, we've seen it in Z, and I'm not sure if everybody know what Z does, so I might just give a very quick brief uh, what exactly we do and how the, the pandemic uh, changed how we are dealing with our uh, uh, market today. Uh, Z basically is uh, an e-commerce enablement uh, uh, platform that enables retailers to uh, have their uh, digital uh, uh, websites and uh, doing e-commerce online. So basically we uh, enable them by the technology, the ecosystem, payment gateways, shipments, uh, and all the required services in order for them to become a fully uh, digital uh, store. Prior to the pandemic, I remember what it took us in two years to achieve. During the pandemic, we were able to achieve uh, um, double, uh, almost triple our business uh, within the pandemic period because I believe uh, when, when, when a, a, a major uh, um, changes in the in the in the uh, uh, like hap happening in the in the industry or in the market. Like for example, whoever thought about uh, there, you cannot open your store. For example, for three or four months, what are you gonna do with your product? Are you gonna reach uh, your client? Your brick and mortar base, uh, your business is all based on uh, a physical store. So um, sometimes having these, um, you know. Bad things happening opens an opportunity uh, for good things uh, happening in the uh, other side. And we, I can assure you that uh, post-pandemic, uh, people were taking things for granted. And because of the pandemic, they, they, they are forced to uh, try something new. And they discovered a different world that they didn't um, uh, have uh, uh, access to or even uh, part of their uh, strategy and, and plan. Uh, however, uh, also an emerging thing that we noticed that is happening um, uh, after they, they, you know, they started opening their stores post the uh, Carrefour and uh, and 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 and, and, and uh, once uh, the life came back to normal, uh, we found that um, they didn't really leave the digital side of stuff. Uh, they uh, use it as a complement. And uh, I could tell that today, for example, in the retail industry, um, it's not um, having a physical store versus a, a digital store. It's not a, a two-sided thing that you need to pick and choose. I believe the future will be a blend of, of what's happening in the, in the digital world and the, in what's happening in the physical world. And uh, I believe so many of the emerging technology uh, that we are seeing today will enable to bridge the gap between uh, those uh, 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 two worlds. So um, I, I believe uh, it is the time for companies to start to uh, experiment, uh, try out, and, and, and uh, try to, to see how things are going to work out with them. I think so. Thank you. Thank you, Pras. I appreciate your insights, definitely. So um, I, I would like to add to, uh, two cents of mine as well on this point. Uh, because uh, as uh, you guys have mentioned, and the topic is emerging technologies, and we are aware that emerging technologies, when something is emerging, it's not always mature enough to be implemented right away. So it always takes some time, but I think this is the right time to indulge yourself in these emerging technologies so that you can be ahead of other people, like other companies, uh, like being a student, if you are learning, AI with augmented reality or virtual reality. So you would be part of like, you can do great stuff in a limited amount of time. But if you are going to wait for two years or three years, the things are going to mature and there would be a lot of people already developed so many applications that you were going to find this right domain for yourself to implement anything. 
So I think uh, for the current time, like implementation of blockchains, uh, implementing AI models, uh, implementing the, anything related to metaverse, uh, this is the best time to do it. Uh, I know that it is uh, not so mature right now. For, if I take an example of metaverse, the, the graphic displays over there, it's not so not that real. Uh, just yesterday, I was in a meditation session in VR, say, in, through VR. And uh, basically, we were doing some kind of a maragba, basically. Uh, but if you if you think that it's on a real face, uh, it's not it's not that the same thing because you are going over there in a form of avatar, and you are interacting with people with limited senses. But in coming days, in coming I think maybe in a year or so, the sensors on your body uh, can can prevail and can basically give you a senses which are physically present in your body. So the I think. The future is here. I think the, the students should go towards implementation and should pick, pick and choose and basically find their focus. If you are going to implement so many things in a limited amount of time, you are not going to be a master of anything. So I would recommend the students to pick the thing of their interest and move forward in that specific direction. Sure, sure. It makes, it makes perfect sense also. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, um, now they can, they, they have so many different avenues, right? If they're, and the amount of innovative appetite that they have, right? It's sky's the limit now because, and like you both very rightly mentioned, these technologies are in its nascent state. They're still pretty early. There's still a lot of development to be involved. And it reminds me early days of the web 92, where, you know, um, I was doing pro scripts right before ASP was invented, before Cold Fusion. It's, we were making dynamic pages using scripting tools. Right, there's no PHP was not developed back then. So, and one thing I keep reminding um, our students now you have so many wonderful choices to learn from. Of course, courses online, YouTube. There's just so much appetite for you know providing these technologies are just really, they have a really, really good selection of choices. So it's really, I would tell them, you know, there's no excuse. If you want to build something, you have a choice where you can learn it from, you know? And I remember, I remember learning HTML from this view source of the page because there's no books available that, because yeah. I'm very, very old. So <laughs> to learn from them back in the early days, yeah. uh, but Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, I mean, it's- and, um, uh, the Mustafa, Dr. Mustafa, you have mentioned that sky is the limit. But I think this phrase is pretty old. It is related to the physical world only. If you are moving towards a digital space, there is no sky, there is no limit. You can do whatever you would like to want, want to do. Basically, if you talk about the physical stuff, like you can buy a property over here, you can buy a car. But in the digital world, you can have many properties. You can have a lot of cars. You can have any kind of digital assets. So, you can create your own worlds. You can create your your metaverse and sure. bring your kind of people over there. So there is no limit on the digital side. I agree with you, completely agree with you. Let me play the, the devil's advocate, right? By saying, you know, really, do we, do we really need this virtual world? I mean, isn't it just a big fad? Isn't it just a big, you know, like it's just trendy right now, but really in five years, are we really going to have this virtual world? I think, it's, an, a... I think it's a natural progression uh, because currently we are dealing with 2D, two dimensional space. And the next progression is would be naturally three dimensional space. You can, it is in, inevitable. You cannot live without it. So, and whatever, if you think that uh, it is right or wrong, it's going to come. Depending on, on your choice, if you doing the right things over there, are you utilizing on the, your, the, for the humanity? You can be, you can use it on the negative side as well. It depends on the company which is implementing this stuff. Sure, sure, very true. I can completely agree with you. Um, and the reason I say this is because these are conversations that people are having and like we have been discussing, you know, since the start of this uh, webinar, it's those companies 
right? That spearhead and they lead the space, especially at a time where things are still being developed. So take, take the Google, right? They came into a market late 90s when people thought, okay, Yahoo had that market completely saturated, but they came in and, you know, we know where Google is today and where Yahoo is, right? So it does make a difference if, if you believe in it, right? You have, to, you have to be a very proactive member of the society, of the ecosystem, and, you know, and develop things, right? Develop a technology, take the, you know, take the lead. And this is something that we always promote in our classes. Speaking of the ecosystem, I know for us back in the day when, you know, when you were a student at uh, CIM at that time, in those days, and mashallah, you were always very, very entrepreneurial. I remember that in my classes. Um, back then when you were involved in your entrepreneurial endeavors, um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges you were facing then? And maybe, you know, we can relate to maybe discuss a few things that are now happening in terms of entrepreneurship ventures and, and such. How were things back then and how would you perceive things now? I think um, uh, if we're going to relate it to our topic today is uh, creating business value. And I believe um, linking it to emerging technology as the uh, key word here. Um, the timing of, of, of when do you introduce your technology is a big, big factor. I remember back in the days, 2003, um, our, our solution was based on integrating two parties together. So it requires internet, it requires a computer, it requires data, it requires uh, uh, integration with, uh, um, with, with, with your internal devices, if you're a hospital. So um, sometimes you might have the perfect technology, the perfect uh, uh, tool in your hand, but the timing is incorrect. So you will uh, uh, struggle for a very, very long time, or you would be investing uh, uh, into making your business work. Uh, for example, I recall that some of our clients didn't have a server. So we went and bought a server to them. Um, at the reception, they don't have a, a PC for, for their uh, re receptionist uh, to uh, get the patient to recording their information. So we had to uh, invest in those areas. Uh, it costs us a lot of money, but uh, fast forward to uh, nowadays, uh, it's in your, it's in, it's in the phone. Uh, you could see, for example, Tawakkanna, it is uh, having all your information. Those things 20 years back was a, a dream. So um, um, choosing your timing is, is very crucial. Uh, I remember uh, when we started to transact the medical information between hospitals and insurance company, um, back in 2003, um, they, in the hospital, they were using faxes, for example, and the patient need to wait in the reception for two hours to get an approval. Uh, with our technology, just get an instant approval if you're eligible for the service uh, uh, or not. Uh, nowadays, if we go to someone and say, oh, I, I can't check your eligibility through the computer, he would really consider you uh, someone who's outdated. Back in the days, they thought about it, oh, it's just a luxury to have. Why should I invest in that? They could wait. So um, uh, picking the right timing is, is, is very, very important when, when to introduce your technology. Uh, I agree, uh, experimenting with the emerging technology is a great stuff. And uh, back to your uh, also initial question when we said uh, about the uh, virtual world, is it, uh, uh, is it something that uh, do we need it? Is it um, it's just a fun to work on? Um, I can tell you uh, what's happening today in these uh, uh, metaverses or the virtual world is the building block to enhance the technology. Uh, I'm gonna bring it in an example and what's happening, for example, in the AI. Uh, most of the breakthrough was in the um, simulating games, for example. They were able to uh, uh, advance whatever they're doing, like in the chess game, uh, solving complex problem was a game. So there is no real uh, business application for it. Uh, they took whatever they learned through the journey and they were able to uh, replicate uh, those models and uh, take the lesson learned from there, what they could do with their, with their models and implement it in a business. So. Uh, for sure, whatever is happening today is great. What's happening, for example, in the NFT, when they use it and in, 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 in having it as a digital asset as, as something that they can perfect 
the 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 mechanism, how the algorithm works, uh, what are the flows, what they could improve on, uh, so it becomes ready. Uh, uh, two years from now, uh, it is something that could be implemented and used uh, uh, later on. So uh, having fun with technology, experimenting with it is, is very crucial. Uh, one point I want to add also is the role of the uh, uh, businesses and the private sector in enabling this. Uh, I'll give a very quick example uh, what we are doing today in Z, for example. Um, today, when we look at our solution and our service, uh, we believe there are a lot of stuff um, that we cannot cover and do ourselves. So uh, we introduce what we call uh, the app market in our platform. So we encourage other developers, other entrepreneurs to come and, and develop their own uh, piece of technology. Uh, we served over 27,000 uh, account. And can you imagine if you're an entrepreneur, if I gave you an opportunity to access uh, uh, this uh, network and, and you have this great idea, it's a great launching platform. So if you have something that is in the emerging technology, something in AI, something in blockchain, you think has a value in our ecosystem, um, we are supporting that. And I believe this is the role of the private sector is not to compete with those small companies, is to become uh, an enabler uh, for those companies to, uh, uh, for those talented guys to, to experiment and, 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 uh, and develop their own things. So um, yeah, this is how I believe you can uh, start building and creating value. That's very smart for us. I mean, it's, it reminds me of when, you know, uh, first of all, when, when our students when our students are saying back in the day it makes me feel so so young so thanks thanks a lot <laughs> i'm just i'm just kidding with you um it reminds me of when facebook right so facebook when it it was launched in mid 20, 2000s and when they opened up you know so that you can build when they opened up the api i remember it was a facebook event it was like the second event of the first one where they were announcing that you know now we've opened up the platform so that you can build applications. So now you think about think about Zynga, right? Uh, Farmville, all those games that were popular back in the day, and those games had amazing amount of value. So think about the platform that it's based on. So, Mashallah, we wish you, we wish you and the Zid organization every success in that. It's very very super smart, Mashallah. Tabarak Allah. That's great stuff. Wonderful. And um, regarding the ecosystem, definitely, you know, today, something I keep reminding my students all the time, you know, to, like you were, like you were, you know, uh, mentioning earlier on, if you're building something, you'd have to buy the server, set up, set up the server, and you're paying maybe hundreds of thousands of reals to get that server up. And you pay for that maybe for one or two months, and then you start to go live, right? So today, uh, with the cloud, what it allows us to build is just something, you know, um, very quickly, you can basically deploy things. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences uh, when it comes to cloud technologies, maybe for a few minutes, just to, uh, just to get the students are excited when it comes to this, this area? Cloud computing aspects and anything that you have worked on uh, from that aspects? Either one, by the way, Fras or Wakas, either one of you that like to. Uh, yeah, basically, I have explored and worked with uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, AWS as well, and uh, Google Cloud Platform. And I think all are pretty good competitors in terms of implementation. Uh, there is a pros and cons uh, with everyone. Uh, but my favorite is Microsoft Azure because I think it's a pretty easy infrastructure. To, to learn and uh, implement things with the integrations available with the IDEs. Uh, you can easily maneuver things uh, like, for example, if you are developing anything with related to ASP.NET and you have uh, like a free kind of free trial version with Microsoft Azure, you can do a single click deployment of your ASP.NET application to Azure. You can utilize cognitive services of Azure Basically, you can perform sentiment analysis uh, of your e-commerce platform. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of functionalities already built into the platform, and you just don't need to develop, reinvent the wheel. You just need to understand what are the 
bits and pieces are available and just you need to plug and play in your application and you are good to go. And you can showcase a demo in, in, a, in a very short amount of time. Uh, just if you are talking about the, some history, like Faraz was telling about the XML of expert like in 90s or 2000, I still remember we used to work on EDI format, uh, which was on electronic data interchange, which was based on XML. And uh, we implemented a core banking solution for Habib Bank in Pakistan. And we used to take all the data on a floppy disk from one place to another, because we don't have used to have internet at that time. So things have moved far, fast forward very really pretty quickly. And with the advent of 5G and 4G, data is everywhere. So these cloud platforms are basically helping us shape the future. Uh, basically the things available as, an, as a modules, as an entities. For example, if I take an example of Azure uh, server side scripting, back in time, like few years back, I need to develop, a, if I need to develop a JavaScript based application, I had to develop the code. I had to search the code from uh, CodePlex or search uh, the solution on Stack Overflow. But now these days, the code snippets are already there. If you want to authenticate and authorize a user, you just need to download that code in your application and you are ready with the SSO implementation or two-factor authentication. So it's that so easy, but for students, you need to understand what the platform is and how to get the things for your benefit. Sure, definitely. And I, I, again, I, I'm very glad that you both are mentioning it's becoming a lot easier. And you know, yeah. we have a good amount of students in the audience. Uh, students love the word easy, right? <laughs> uh, it's attractive for them. Obviously, I don't, I don't blame them because now, um, so now we're using, you know, we use the Google Cloud, and there's three hundred dollars worth of free credit. So yeah. I, I I challenged them. I said, you know, I hope that your site, your project gets so busy that Google invoices you anything above three hundred. And I tell them I'll pay for that extra. Don't worry about that. But <laughs> um, it's it's Alhamdulillah. It's just it is so convenient and so easy. And when you have all these cloud infrastructures. You can maintain them from your phone. You know, yeah, it's just yeah, it doesn't get better than this, guys. It really doesn't. So, uh, really, in terms of you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, this this webinar and you know, the insights that have been provided by all the panel members, we hope that you know our our students are doing audience and students they uh, do great things. I tell them three things: you know, do great things for yourself first, for your family, for yourselves, for your country, and you know, and be a be a contributor to the society, just like you find folks are, right? You're contributing, um, adding value. Um, and this is this is what it's about. So it's, it's great to be able to, you know, um, to be able to be at the stage where the next, you know, next eight years, as we, as we, you know, go forward with Saudi Vision 2030. And as you know, Saudi Vision 2030 is not a, it's not really a, uh, it's not really a milestone. It's just a part of the journey, right? And nothing stops at 2030. It's just, it gets very, very interesting. And Alhamdulillah, I keep reminding family, friends, students, colleagues, clients that Alhamdulillah, we're at a very fantastic time. And we hope that, you know, Allah SWT blesses us so that we can do great things moving forward. So um, any, any final thoughts you wanna add? Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, um, you know, your personal journeys, like, you know, you know, what is it developing for the next, you know, what's on your plans or whatever you can share. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to ask for company secrets, don't worry. But anything that's, you know, are you, of course, it's a very exciting time, definitely. Um, you know, but the, but the use of these technologies with the AI, especially AI, when it comes to, you know, an, an analysis of traffic, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think, especially, mashallah, with your, your passion in AI and technology for us. I think, uh, inshallah, you do great things for your company and for yourself and for the country. Uh, anything you want to share as far as moving forward, that'd be great. Sure, absolutely. Uh, just one quick comment on the, uh, the availability of technology, just one message. If, uh, if you're not going to start doing it, someone else will come and do it because the barriers now are becoming uh, uh, 
you know, uh, it's much more easier for people to, to start working. So uh, as you mentioned, it's an opportunity to start working. It's a race and whoever, uh, uh, you know, have the commitment and the well, they will really achieve uh, great stuff. Uh, in terms of what we're doing here today with AI and these emerging technologies, um, I believe our core focus for the upcoming year is how to use those technology in order to help our customers to grow. Uh, for example, how they're able to optimize their content, how they're optimizing their order, how they have a better uh, uh, a better targeting to their audience, uh, to know which product is selling more than the other, what kind of uh, tweaks they need to do, um, how they're able to increase their basket size, um, how they're able to bundle. Uh, and uh, using uh, such tools is mainly focused on how to make them uh, grow. And... Um, we don't want to be positioned as just go subscribe, we're just giving you a website. No, there is a value added to what you're buying. So uh, we might be even offering the website for a very minimal charges, but we would help you uh, to deploy those advanced technology and help you to grow because as they grow, as uh, our business, um, it's a win-win situation. Both of us uh, start growing. So uh, definitely we will be investing and in focusing more on how to uh, uh, help our customer to grow because as long as they're growing, as long as they're going to be with us, uh, whenever their business is not growing, they will churn and, and just maybe stop doing it or moving somewhere else. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. And we wish you and your platforms the very best. And... Um, one thing I, you know, our students talk about is, you know, Riyadh has changed quite a lot, and Riyadh has become this tech hub. And uh, but I remind students that, you know, even Dharan also uh, engines. I mean, all the cities, I would say, definitely Riyadh has a lot of attention, and very rightfully so. Uh, but also here in Dharan and in Jeddah, there's just, you know, amazing, amazing amount of opportunities. Just to, you just have to look into what you want to do, and you can start to build things fairly, fairly. Um, nothing is easy but it's a lot more convenient, a lot more accessible than it was back in the day as we were discussing. Uh, definitely, I think. Uh, anything else uh, you'd like to add, Brother uh, Anything, any final thoughts on budding entrepreneurs or students? Uh, where would you advise them to start looking at, you know, or any kind of ventures that you the, anything you would like the to biggest share? advice uh, the biggest advice from my side to students would be to have a focus uh, because the understanding of these latest technologies or emerging technologies takes patience as well uh, because when you are learning so many things on different domains you can feel yourself being lost so you need to consider you need to have a plan in front of you. You should have a training plan, like for two or months or three months, what you're going to study and what you're going to implement. Because this is a very practical field. This is not, this is not much of a theory side. You have already got the theories. You, are, you already understand the business. You just need to implement the stuff which is related to your domain. For example, if you are developing, a, let's suppose, a customer experience website or customer experience related stuff like doing analytics, for any customers doing uh, uh, like using Power BI, Microsoft Power BI, you know, doing some charting solutions for them using ClickView. So you need to understand the tools, the patterns, the practices, and what are the industry gurus are doing right now. You have to pick and choose a specific mentor in your field as well, because getting understanding from the mentors can save you a lot of time, can save you a lot of frustrations because we have been through these kind of stuff and we have, we have been traversing the different websites for the complete day, trying to grasp the ideas. But if you can find a good, if I say the word guru, who can help you out in five minutes. So you don't need a full day to spend on a specific problem to find a solution for that. So my biggest advice for the students would be to have focus have discipline in your approach, because if you don't have a certain amount of discipline, if you are going here and there after some time, uh, you would be frustrated eventually. Sure, sure. So this couple of slides that I had while we were discussing this is the Jetson era, right? With just amazing things that people can 
do in their homes, autonomous vehicles, uh, flying, you know, um, electric planes. It's just, just you know, we're at, a, at the front of something, just a phenomenal time with AI and these technologies that are driving this. And just, you know, we're approaching something like this. It's just a, a graphic from the uh, fifth element um, movie. So very, very interesting time. So I think at this, I think it's a good time to stop. And I want to thank you uh, both for time out, for taking time out of your personal time. And I know Brother Khaz, it's already it's past eight o'clock. It's uh, close to nine o'clock in, uh, in Pakistan. So Jazakallah khair. And for us, thank you so much no for problem. your time. No problem. I'm, it's always wonderful for me to uh, talk to you both. So I just wanted to take that. And it's, you know, I think the audience benefited quite a lot, definitely. And so the audience, if they have any questions, they can always ask and we'll pass it on to you. But on just behalf of KBS and uh, our centers, we'd like to thank you for, uh, for everything. And uh, I'd like to invite um, our department chairman, Dr. Mohammed Al-Khars, who is a department chairman for uh, information systems and operations management uh, to share with us um, any closing remarks Anything that you'd like to add value? Thank you so much. Dr. Muhammad, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers and attendees for attending this uh, forum. Now, I know the time is not the best time for everyone. And yani from Pakistan, from Saudi, from uh, the North America, but the, the content of this forum is very important. And I think uh, we all benefit from this, uh, from this uh, discussion. Now, this is the start of the, uh, of the uh, topics on emerging technologies. I'm quite sure that there are additional forums uh, that will address other aspects of the emerging technologies. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending and sharing your knowledge and experience on this, on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we'll stop here and look forward to holding many, many other uh, forums and we look forward to inviting everyone. And thank you again for all the panel speakers for wonderful, wonderful insights that they've shared with everybody. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much.